starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Ivan IV, more commonly known as Ivan the Terrible. He was the son of Vasily III, who is the Rurikid ruler of the Grand Duchy of Moscow. After his father's death, however, at just three years old, Ivan was named the Grand Prince, and by the time he was 16, he was declared as the Tsar or Emperor of Russia, officially establishing the Tsardom of Russia. Ivan and his reign are certainly known for the transformation of Russia from a medieval state to an empire, but not without a huge cost to the people of Russia, as well as a hit to the long-term economy. Ivan has been described as being intelligent and devout, but also prone to paranoia, rage, and episodic outbreaks of mental instability that only increased the older he got. One of the main points of extreme violence and viciousness was the massacre of Novgorod, which saw the deaths of an estimated 2,000 to 15,000 people, as well as a shocking amount of acts of extreme, violent cruelty. In the later years, like I mentioned, his violent tendencies only got worse, which led to him doing things like striking his heir in the heat of an argument so badly that it left him with brain damage. In the end, Ivan the Terrible met his demise from a heart attack in 1584. Yeah, they say that impaling hundreds of people every day isn't great for the heart health. Someone should have let him know about vitamins and minerals, or maybe some good cardio heavy exercise. I don't know. In our number 9 spot today, we have Leopold II. As the second king of the Belgians, Leopold has been said to be responsible for the deaths of somewhere between 2 to 15 million people. Yeah, million. It wasn't in Belgium that he committed his atrocious acts, however. It all started when he claimed himself to be the founder and sole owner of the Congo Free State, which was a private project he undertook on his own. Leopold loved colonialism. He wanted to colonize everything he possibly could, and this is why he started the International African Society, which he used to travel to Africa, claim land that obviously wasn't his, and we're not talking about a small piece. We're talking about land that is several times the size of Belgium, and many countries just let him do this and allowed him to freely rule this land. This is definitely already bad enough, but of course things only got worse. Leopold had his own private militia that he used to force the indigenous population into hard labor. While Leopold was doing this, of course, for economic reasons, he also was just doing this because he was a messed up guy. He was terrible. He made those who lived here harvest and process rubber, and the punishments for those who didn't harvest enough for him were extremely severe. Not to mention, it is also said that sometimes he would just inflict harm because he could. Eventually, a stop needed to be put to his wrongdoings, but of course he was going to do everything he could to hide some of the horrors he did. The entire archive of the Congo Free State was burned, and he told his aide that even though the Congo had been taken from him, quote, they have no right to know what I did there. The Congo was taken from him, but remained under the rule of Belgium in 1908 until the Congo was given independence in 1960. As for Leopold, well, he remained the ruler of Belgium until his death in 1909, but the secret was out now, and no one liked him. In fact, his funeral procession was booed by the crowd because everyone was angry at him for the things that he had done. In our number 8 spot today, we have Qin Shi Huang. While this leader is often credited with creating the first unified Chinese empire, the Qin Dynasty, these accomplishments didn't come cheap. When he came to power in 221 BCE, he strictly followed seven principles, which not only pushed for severe punishment, but also acted in contraries and issued unattainable orders. He also is said to have been extremely paranoid about the power of the educated, which led to him burning books so that no one could ever learn what was in them, and he also killed 460 Confucian scholars in just one year, which some claim was because they were unable to make him immortal? Huang wanted not only to establish a transport system, but also build a wall to keep out enemies, and this meant that he had to relocate at least 120,000 families. He declared that all would be equal under one law, and then taxed everyone heavily. And because of these heavy taxes, as well as the insane labor that was expected to create the wall and the transport system, thousands of people were overworked, starved, and perished. He also had laborers create a massive tomb for him, complete with 8,000 life-size terracotta warriors and horses, which you may be familiar with, because now it is rumored to be an extremely haunted place. I mean, an evil ruler's resting place? Yeah, of 
course it's haunted. In our number 7 spot today we have Don Carlos. I'll be honest, this little troublemaker never made it to the title of king, but he sure was a little too close for comfort when you hear about the kind of things he was doing. Carlos was the prince of Asturias during the mid 1500s as he was the eldest son of King Philip II of Spain. It is said that Carlos may have had some troubles right from birth which many believe could be due to the inbreeding that was common in the family at the time. Descriptions of his behaviours though are far worse than what anyone could have expected. It is said that Carlos did horrible things like hurting or taking the lives of animals just for fun. I mean nowadays we call that a huge warning sign for potential killers. Back then they just chalked it up to boys being boys. It is even said that at one point he purposefully blinded all of the horses in the royal stable. Red flags, they were abundant. Soon of course his cruelties would extend to humans with people claiming that one time he chose to whip a servant girl for no reason other than because he could. And apparently one time he made a shoemaker eat a pair of shoes that he had made the prince that he didn't like. He was just a little twerp. Carlos was set up by his family to marry the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours with the man, she decided there's no way in hell. Like he was so bad, she would rather marry his dad, which she did in 1560. In the end, Carlos was found to be plotting to take out his own father, which landed him in prison in solitary confinement, where he passed away six months later. In our number six spot today, we have King Charles the Sixth. King Charles the Sixth started off his reign by being very well loved and respected, but as time went on over his four decades of ruling, he ended up being known as Charles the Mad. His erratic behavior had him happy packing up knights, imagining that he was Saint George, and he would also have bouts of amnesia where he would be able to recognize some people but not his wife and children. This is all very strange and of course quite sad as he was obviously exhibiting signs of extreme mental illness, but one of the strangest symptoms was him believing that he was made of glass. He was terribly frightened of falling or being jostled too hard and he would actually insert iron rods into his clothing to try and keep himself from shattering. But then he he would also apparently run wild at top speeds throughout the halls of the castle or the streets, which would obviously mean that he was totally abandoning his fear of fragility. It apparently got so bad that he had to be held inside with the entrances bricked up. Sadly, he continued on this path until he passed away in 1422. At number 5, The Horse and His Boy On the less violent end of the spectrum, Jahangir was actually a big fan of the arts, science, and worldly things. Unlike his father who couldn't read and write, and interesting skill for a ruler not to have, Jahangir was all about it. He really wasn't interested in military, which was a task he left to his son. But he did inherit his father's wealth and considering he wasn't working in the military, he had time to indulge his curiosity. In his memoirs, there are fantastic paintings of exotic animals. There is a painting of a zebra that has a very funny story behind it. The zebra was being taken as a gift to the Shafavid Shah and it was travelling through the port of the empire. Jahangir heard about it and had it brought to court first and didn't believe that it was real. He thought that it was a painted horse, so he had people try and wash them off. Only when the paint didn't come off, did he realize his mistake and ordered that the wondrous creature be painted. At number 4, Shah Jahan and the Taj Mahal Okay, so this one isn't messed up for violence or anything, but it is the ultimate love story and we just can't leave it off this list. There is one part that is messed up to me because man, I don't even know, but we will get to that. If you've ever been to India, then one of the stops you made on your trips was probably to the Taj Mahal, a breathtaking mausoleum built by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan to commemorate the love of his life. Considering how big and intricate it is, you know that their love was bigger than any storybook. An Indian poet called the Taj Mahal a teardrop on the cheek of time, a testament to grief and power. Mumtaz Mahal was Shah Jahan's favorite wife, forsaking all of his other wives just to be with her. They went everywhere together, even on military missions. This is where, from my perspective, where things get crazy. This woman delivered 14 children for her husband. 14. Sadly, whilst giving birth to the last, she passed away, inspiring her king to build this massive structure. Both Shah Jahan and his love are buried beneath it. At number 3, Brothers at Odds. Shah Jahan's rule was considered the golden rule of the Mughal Empire, so how do you top that? Aurangzeb did not even bother trying, and he kinda sucked. 
He was Shah Jahan's third son, and he was a very military minded man, showing tactical and strategic military skill and unrivaled determination. Whereas his brother was a man of letters, and no, not the kind from Supernatural. Aurangzeb wanted power, and so in order to secure his rule, he confined his ailing father to his own palace, caused the death of one of his brothers, and had two more of his brothers, a son and a nephew, executed. He was literally committing fatricide left, right, and center. But it didn't matter to him because he gained control. Control. His desire to prematurely end the lives of those who stood in his way was described as, quote, a wolf thirsting for the blood of his brothers, end quote. You would think that this motivation to gain power and rule on his own terms would mean that he had big plans for the empire, which in a way is true, but those plans and changes led to a lot of oppression, but we will get to that in a bit. Item number two, staked. Before we get into the oppression that Aurangzeb caused to his empire, let's talk about Emperor Farouk Siyar. Farouk Siyar was emperor of the Mughal Empire from 1713 to 1719. He was described as an incapable ruler who gave his power to all of his advisors. His rule caused many conspiracies and plots to arise within the court. He caused a lot of people a lot of pain for his plight for power. With the help of his allies, he gave many of his enemies the gift of the big sleep, but by far the most ruthless thing he did was kill Jahandar Shah and Zulkifakar Khan Nazrat Zung. What made their deaths so brutal was the fact that when they went eh, the emperor hung their heads on poles, and just to add insult to injury, he made their parents walk at their funeral. Luckily for the people of the Mughal Empire, Farouk Sahir was killed by unknown assailants at the instructions of his close relatives, putting an end to his awful reign. And finally, at number one, the Great Oppressor. Aurangzeb's rule sort of had two chapters to it. At first, Aurangzeb was a capable ruler of a mixed Muslim Hindu empire who was feared yet respected for his vigor and skill. But around 1680, Aurangzeb's rule changed drastically in both policy and attitude. His once unified people of both Muslims and Hindus broke apart, and people of Hindu faith became subordinates, not colleagues. On top of that, Aurangzeb added some more oppression to the mix and not only destroyed Hindu temples, but he also also reimposed the Giza tax on non-Muslims after the tax was initially banned by Emperor Akbar. For the first 20 years of Aurangzeb's rule, he did not impose a tax, but all of a sudden he started demanding these payments, and historians believe that Hindu uprisings are what caused the emperor to act harshly towards the non-Muslim population. This discrimination caused a revolt to unfold that Aurangzeb's third son supported. Aurangzeb spent his last 50 years taking his aggressions out on the Hindus in the empire, and it's for this reason that he is remembered by many as a tyrant. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Nero. For this one, we are taking it all the way back to the age of the Roman Empire. When we think back to these times, they weren't necessarily the most kind, peaceful of times, but there certainly are some characters that stand out as being particularly brutal, and one of those is Nero. Throughout his reign, he wreaked havoc on the Roman Empire, he burned cities, he killed thousands of people, including every member of his own family, and I mean, we know the inventive execution methods of the past, so you can probably guess at just how brutal these all were. Most Roman sources give us an almost complete completely negative review of him in reference to both his personality and his reign as a leader. He was called compulsive and corrupt, and it is believed that he is actually to blame for the great fire that burned Rome, but instead he used the Christians as a scapegoat so that they would receive punishments rather than him. In the end, after being declared a public enemy by the Roman Senate and realizing that the rebellion would be lost, he ended up taking his own life at the age of 30. In our number 9 spot today, we have Shoko Asahara. Leader of the Om Shinriko cult, this person claimed to be the reincarnation of the Hindu god Shiva. He said that he was destined to lead his followers to salvation once the apocalypse came, but then once he lured in followers, he claimed that he could also teach them to levitate and develop telepathic abilities seems very legit. Apparently, those who were the most skeptical, he allowed them to drink his bath water. No idea why or what this was supposed to be for, and I wish I could unlearn it to be honest, but now we all just have to suffer with that information together. The cult continued to grow and drew in influential and wealthy people, and what did he do? Well, he made a science division of this cult, and this is where they studied the microorganisms living in his bathwater. I'm just kidding, it was actually really messed up. The group went on to attack Tokyo in 1994, which took the lives of seven people. Then, in 1995, they released gas into the Tokyo underground, which led to 12 deaths, 50 injured people, and more than 5,000 people with temporary vision problems. In the end, he and 11 of his disciples ended up being arrested and charged, and they were all sentenced to death in 2004. In our number eight, but today we have Victoriano Alvarez. 
Clipperton Island was an island that is located in the Pacific, and during the 18th and 19th century, everyone was trying to lay claim to it and rule it. I'm talking about Britain, France, Mexico, and of course, our friend Victoriano. He was actually the lighthouse keeper on the island, and in 1910, when Mexico needed to stop sending vital supplies to the island because they were focused on the rising revolution happening there, most of the inhabitants ended up contracting scurvy, which sadly led to their death. In the end, only Victoriano, a small group of soldiers, and about 12 women and children were left. The soldiers ended up passing away shortly after in an accident, so you know what Mr. Lighthouse did? He threw all but one of the rifles into the sea, loaded the one remaining weapon, and like the worst person he is, he declared himself king of the island. From here, he went on to kill anyone who disagreed with him, and he was also extremely harmful to the women who unfortunately were left on the island. That was until one badass woman named Tirza Randon simply had enough. She found a hammer and, well, the rest is history. In our number 7 spot today, we have Richard Nixon. This is perhaps one of the largest scandals and leaks in history, especially in the history of the United States. In the middle of 1972, there were five men who were arrested for breaking into and subsequently trying to bug the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate Hotel complex in Washington, D.C. As the year went on, the 1972 presidential election came closer, and there was an anonymous source who fed information to Washington Post reporters Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward that, quote, the Watergate bugging incident stemmed from a massive campaign of political spying and sabotage conducted on behalf of President Nixon's re-election and directed by officials of the White House. Despite this information leak and it being reported in the news, Nixon was still re-elected, but he was also under serious investigation. There were a series of Senate hearings, and the Senate even went on to create a special investigative committee. The hearings were broadcast nationwide, and they had witnesses testifying that Nixon had approved plans to cover up administration involvement in the break-in and that there was a voice-activated taping system in the Oval Office. These hearings captured the attention of Americans everywhere for weeks, and in the end, the United States Supreme Court ruled that Nixon had to release these Oval Office tapes to government investigators, which then went on to reveal that he had not only attempted to cover up what went on, but he also later tried to use federal officials to deflect the investigation. Under the threat of an imminent an impeachment, Nixon had no choice but to admit his guilt and resign, making him the only president to do so. His successor, Gerald Ford, ended up pardoning him so he escaped prosecution, but there were 69 other people indicted, with 48 of them later being convicted. Remember that anonymous source who spilled the information in the first place? Well, his identity remained a secret for 33 years until 2005, when former FBI agent Mark Felt revealed himself as the source. This is probably the biggest political scandal in U.S. history, and it revealed corruption beyond what Americans at the time could believe. It truly changed the way that people would look at government leaders forever. In our number six spot today, we have Kurt Gödel. The Austrian-American philosopher and mathematician Kurt Gödel lived from 1906 to 1978, and he made quite a name for himself. Being compared to the likes of Aristotle and Einstein, he is best known for his incompleteness theorem, which was a very significant mathematical result. He was obviously very successful and found himself teaching and educating a younger generation, but his personal life is where things got quite dark. When he was just six years old, he had a case of rheumatic fever, which left him quite ill for the rest of his childhood. This led to him first being pretty preoccupied with his health, and unfortunately, this turned into hypochondria, which then led him down a path of complete paranoia. He ended up having an irrational fear of getting poisoned, so to avoid this, he would only eat food that had been prepared by his wife, who also had to taste it beforehand. Sadly, his wife was hospitalized in 1977 for six months, which obviously left her unable to prepare food for him. Because of the fact that she was unable to do this for him, during this period he refused to eat, which eventually led to him starving to death. Number 5. Domestic Disturbance William the Conqueror was one down bad dude. The illegitimate ruler to the throne left a bad taste in some people's mouths, and was just as ruthless in silencing those rebellions that were always uprising against him as he was with the famous battles he was a part of, like the Battle of Hastings. But what I think he should be remembered by is the way he asked Matilda to marry him, or rather the extreme measures he took when she refused his advances because he was an illegitimate leader. William dragged Matilda by the hair out into the middle of the street and beat her until she agreed to marry him. I don't have to tell you how messed up that is, and I sure hope I don't. Number 4. Nero Sauna 
The Romans were kind of a big deal, especially if you're into history. Large city, culture, and some other structures are still around today. That's kind of cool. But while the city of Rome may have been the best city on earth at the time, Romans themselves could use a little work. Meet Emperor Nero, the vicious leader of Rome who became emperor through ill-gotten gains. However, in what may have been one of the first acts of flexing the male patriarchy, the divorce or forced separation of his wife Claudia Octavia comes to mind. It was a rocky marriage from the start. There was a general dislike from the very beginning, but when Nero remarried, as emperors did, he had Octavia banished to an island, where shortly after she would be suffocated in a hot vapor bath. Her demise was sad for most Romans. Oh yeah, and they tried to make it look like she did herself in. That's messed up, man. Number 3. Pedestal I think in a healthy relationship, you ought to put your partner on a pedestal sometimes. Maybe your partner is drop dead gorgeous. A promising athlete really enjoys collecting stamps. You go, little rock star, collect those presidential stamps. However, Emperor Caligula of Rome had some other ideas. He would literally put his wife, who he claimed to love, up on a pedestal stark naked and let his friends in the military gawk and glare at her. He would also say to her that he could end her life whenever he wanted and put a knife against her for no reason. Weird flex, but okay. This guy was awful to everyone as he tormented and unalive so many people. Well, you sure wouldn't want to see his face everywhere as he liked to do just that. Built statues of himself everywhere because after losing your family to his tyranny and looking at his wife, you need to know who's responsible for all this. That's messed up. Number 2. Doozong 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 That wouldn't really be a great fraternity name, would it? Well, the Emperor of Doozong of China would think differently as when he was in charge, that's pretty much what the royal court looked like. Enough drinking to keep AA in meetings for 100 years, and enough ladies of the evening to... Well, I don't have a joke for this one, but there were a lot of them, trust me. Having massive parties like that and enjoying the company of other women is not how you respect your wife. To make matters worse, it seemed that too much partying may have been a bad thing. Who would have thought? As what he made up for in a fun weekend, he lacked in governing, as the Mongols were at his front door, or gate rather. Eventually, his empire would burn to the ground. All thanks to Al. Alcohol and many women who lay down for their lives, literally. Number one, side piece. Look, I enjoy the company of a woman just as much as the next king sits on his throne. But in my opinion, once you find a wife, it's time to settle down, relax, no more crazy parties like Duzong. This is another generalization, but every king did this. Every king in the past has had mistresses, as if that is a totally okay thing to do to your wife and oftentimes the queen of your kingdom. I'm a reasonable guy, so maybe I can see having your side piece waiting in the wings to be stage center, but it's never one, is it? It's always multiple. Ladies of the past, all I can say is make sure you give birth to a boy and watch your back. They're coming for you. Kicking off the list at number 10, a goodnight kiss. We'll start off funny, okay? History can be funny sometimes, even when it's not meant to be, and it's meant to be completely serious, I can't help but read this information and laugh. Royals were sweating constantly about people trying to take them out, of course. I mentioned Boy Jones on here a few times. That guy stalked the queen over and over for years. Historically, these royals have been on the lookout for enemies, and the way that they prevent these attacks, yeah, sometimes it can be a little funny. Like the kissing sheets, for example. Have you heard about this weird position in the castle? What an odd job this is. A great deal of monarchs hired taste testers to make sure nobody poisoned their ale, which is, you know, pretty lousy job there. Either having a good day or a bad day, no in between. But they also had a guy kiss the king's sheets every day, just, he just kissed the entire bed. The king size, may I remind you, massive bed. King Henry VIII, this guy hired somebody to literally just go in, get snuggled up, and just make sure the king's bed wasn't poisoned. There's nothing on it that's gonna make the skin go all ouchy. But he would just get in his bed and just Let's go to sleep for a bit. You are required to make the king's bed every morning, of course, and before he gets back in, you gotta get in and you gotta get in and kiss that bed, man. You gotta kiss that bed real good. Mwah, mwah. Let's go. Mwah. All right, time to clock out for the day. Mwah. One more for good luck. Clothes as well. That was touched. Maybe not kissed, but it was for sure worn and touched. With it's so weird. Guys wearing my clothes in my bed. No way. I'd rather get poisoned. Like, yo, take my jeans off. Who is that guy? Get back here. Like, imagine marrying that king, and it's like, oh, hang on, before we get snugged in, this guy has to go and kiss your sheets. She's like, ew, what? Why does my sheets smell like breath? Everything smells like breath. 
Number nine, enemas. We gotta talk about perhaps one of the worst sights to see in the household. This, yeah. Back in the olden days, ye olden days, enemas were the talk of the town. Well, rather, the palace. Like most things in the 1400s, only the rich could afford the enema supplies, specifically King Louis XIV. Guy loved enemas. Just big old fan of enemas. It's believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. Thousands, it's a lot of, a lot of decimals. Decimals for enemas. In just one year, Louis received 212 enemas. Like, guy, that's like 112 too much, I'd say, I don't know. He would always take it a step further, and dare I say, a step fancier, by using um, almond milk for the enemas. Imagine being married to a guy and he pulls out almond milk and you're like, oh no, not again, come on, Louis, please, I just ate. Number eight, no bathing in this house. Bathing in the olden days wasn't fully understood, if that makes any sense. Like in a medical book, in an official 16th century medical book, the medical advice was use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body and maketh the venomous air to enter and for to infect the blood. First of all, huh? What? What does it even mean? Why is every shred of medical knowledge always written in riddles? God forbid you have bronchitis in the 16th century. A doctor would just be like, ah, yes, just a drop of ale and a witch's flick and you'll be on your way. Like, what? Do you have any halls? Help me. Help me, dude. No, I'm just mad. I just, like, bro, I have pneumonia. I need, I need medicine. So, of course, they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. Of course. So, King James IV, apparently, this guy never took a bath in his life. And his hygiene was so bad that he would sometimes pass lice to others just by being in the same room that he was earlier. So not at the same time, he would come in, do his king stuff, leave, and the lice would be like, Pew! and they would just wait in that room and get on someone else. That's so gross, that's horrible. Lice would emit off this man, like the, he's like the stinky kid from Charlie Brown with the stinky cloud. That's just like lice around this guy. <laughs> Margaret Tudor was married to King James. Yeah, must have loved the no bathing thing, eh? Oh, oh boy. Number seven, Queen Caroline. Queen Caroline. Ba, ba, ba. She went out in a horrible way. We can't sing about her. History remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she went out. It was bad. It was actually written down in an epigram attributed to the 18th century poet Alexander Pope. Here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. Again, it rhymes. Why do all the, why is everything rhyming? This is so awful. Who can be like, yeah, yeah, write that down. That's good. That's good. Wait, wait. It does rhyme. That's good. Yeah, check it out. Rest in peace. My gosh, her husband, he was certainly no help at all. Caroline was previously married to George IV, and this guy locked her out of Westminster on Coronation Day. So yeah, she went out in a horrible way, but let's not forget the marriage that came beforehand. That wasn't pleasant either. Nothing in this guy or this marriage was pleasant. Number six, Henry VIII. Of course he's back. He had six wives, and it was pretty much entirely bad for all of them, yeah. It was the late 1400s. Henry took the throne in 1509. This guy was only 17 years old when all of this madness began to unfold. Only days after the execution of Anne, who I mentioned on part one of this list, so days after he married his third wife, Jane Seymour. Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour's mothers were first cousins, so they were close, and during all of this, they, of course, went head to head more than once. Jane died shortly after giving birth to Edward VI on October 12, 1537. I can't mention King Henry's wives and leave a couple out. This is just a history channel. We have to mention all of them, okay? Hey, number five, Pedro of Castile. Pedro of Castile was doing as the European monarchs do. Sometimes you gotta marry for alliances. Sure, it makes sense. Your kingdom is much less likely to get steamrolled by a larger kingdom if you have an alliance with fellow kingdoms or the bigger kingdom itself, actually. Pedro of Castile married the young Blanche of Bourbon of France, and so Spain could just be a wee bit more snug, you know, in case the English come over. You gotta be careful. But Pedro just wasn't having it. What he was having instead was a mistress named Maria. So instead of enduring a loveless marriage, he had poor Blanche locked away in a tower, just like Sleeping Beauty. Except a handsome prince was not coming to rescue this damsel in distress, uh, but a man with a black hood and a sharpened axe. You know what I'm talking about. As Pedro had her unalived. I was gonna make a joke about Rapunzel and let down some hair so she could make an escape, but I mean, that's just, that's just awful, really. Imagine being locked up in a tower for so long. Sure, I love the indoors, but you gotta let me out at some point, chief. Do you think I get food delivery apps to work up in a tower? Because otherwise you have to let me out, dude. Comic-Con's coming. Anime Convention North's coming, buddy. I gotta go. I gotta, get, gotta get my Naruto on, bro. Come on, man. Number four, hands-on funeral. This one's just gross. 
When you're in a relationship, it can provide you with some great things, someone to go through life with, companionship, love, and if you're lucky, someone who's a good cook or a baker. Oh, love me some baked goods. Mm. However, also in a relationship, sometimes you do more than that. Sometimes you get a little close under the sheets, if you know what I'm saying. Take King Philip V, for an example, who loved loving his wife so much that, he, well, he just couldn't help himself, you know? Like, for instance, when his wife tragically passed away, he wanted one last, um, one last ride. But he penciled in one more trip to Toe Curl City before she was laid to rest. I, I just, God, it doesn't seem right, you know? It just let her, you know, let her, let her go peacefully, you know? Let her just, ah. Number three, Lenin. Okay, while not a king in the most stereotypical sense, he did dethrone a king and made himself an autocratic dictator, which is basically a king just modern. Trust me, it is. It, yep, trust me. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, Lenin had been anti-royal for most of his life, but after some help from some sneaky Germans and other Soviets loyal to his cause, the Tsar had no choice but to abdicate, like I said at the top of the list. He abolished the Tsar's secret police and then put in his own. Mm. And had people oppressed, which was one of the main reasons why the whole revolution started in the first place. See what I'm getting at? He was supposed to get rid of the evil monarch, and he became the evil monarch. Hmm. Well, see, then a civil war broke out, and then he was worried that the exiled Tsar might escape and try to retake the throne, and, well, he had some goons take care of him, and, uh, well, the family, too. You, you can never be too sure. You gotta take care of everything. You, know, you gotta get rid of everybody. You just can't be too sure. Number two. Pope John the 12th. For those who aren't very religious like myself, the Pope is the big one. He's next to God, and for a minute there, he was the most powerful man on earth. Seriously, I mean, th this guy could crown kings. He's the king of the Vatican, and the king of kings in the Holy Scripture. It's kind of serious. And today, he's got a really cool car for parades. The Pope Mobile is pretty sick, I'm not gonna lie. However, Pope John the 12th was anything but a sweet old man who delivers the holy messages from God. This Pope was doing a lot of anti-Pope behavior, if you will. Now, I for one wouldn't care if the man had a girlfriend or a glass of wine. Heck, some rules need to be changed, but this Pope uh, was most known for his lavish, how you say, adult-themed parties, and was known for getting hangovers. It got so bad at one point, it started a war. Number one, not so slick shady. Marshall Mathers, Eminem, the king of rap and named king of hip hop by Rolling Stones magazine. Hence he's the king, I gotcha. Despite what you think of the man's lyrics, especially vulgarity, he's an excellent wordsmith and could write rhymes that would leave you tongue twisted. However, I don't think it would come to anyone's surprise that the man's got a few charges under his belt, especially the way he talks about Kim. There's a couple, a couple of bad things said about her, I don't know. Back in 2001, arguably the peak of his career, Eminem assaulted somebody in a nightclub after getting fresh with his wife. He got two years probation. Hmm. Maybe, maybe, maybe he is saying the things he's saying in those songs. Maybe he's telling the truth. Hmm, I don't know. At number 10, some background. The Mughal dynasty in India was founded by Babur, a descendant of the one, the only, Genghis Khan and Tamerlane. After he defeated a sultan of Delhi named Ibrahim Lodi in 1526, Babur was the first step in the Mughal dynasty that would last for over three centuries. To say that the empire was immense is an understatement. The empire ruled over 103 million people, probably even more. The Mughals were rooted in Muslim beliefs and were noted for their well-organized government and cultural sophistication. Many of the rulers tried to integrate the Hindus and Muslims under one state, but as we will find out from this list, it was not an easy thing to do, which ended up causing a lot of strife. Many rulers of the empire flip-flopped back and forth between being merciful and tyrannical towards the Hindus, adding to centuries of oppression. At number 9, Blinded. Humayun was set to inherit the throne from his father, much to the jealousy of his brothers. He was 23 when he ascended the throne in 1530 after the death of his father. His brothers reigned over different fiefs, but none of them were satisfied unless they had the crown. He also wasn't the best ruler. Humayun was sent into exile for 15 years after he was overthrown by one of his father's generals, Sher Shah. Humayun fled and eventually ended up in Persia where he built back up an army 
through his partnership with the Shah. Slowly, he took back his land, facing his own brothers who were constantly scheming against him. But Babur, his father, made him promise that he would never lay a hand on his brothers. But his brother Kamran continued to threaten him, and one instance while defending a fort turned on the innocents trapped inside and took their lives viciously. Kamran, not a good dude. Something needed to be done. He eventually catches his scheming brothers, blinds his brother Cameron, and chains his brother Ascari. A little messed up, but like, you know, not bad for war. Before I carry on with the rest of the video, make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel and maybe consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far. At number 8, Akbar. Humayun continued to deal with the competition of his brothers until finally his reign came to an end, but not in the way that you would expect. He was carrying a bunch of books up some stairs and he accidentally fell, leading to a lethal head injury. His 13 year old son Akbar had to inherit the throne. Akbar would later become known as the Great, but that doesn't mean that he didn't do some questionable things. Where his father failed to conquer, Akbar swept through. But just like his father, he encountered jealousy and dangerous ambition in the dark corners of his reign. In Delhi, an attempt to assassinate him was made, the bowman nearly missing him. Who was behind it? The slave of a nobleman who recently tried to start a rebellion. But the plot thickens. Akbar's foster brother's mother had further designs to establish power for herself through her son, Adam Khan. Khan actually ended up taking the life of Akbar's foster father, which led to Akbar throwing him down the stairs and therefore killing him. The mother died 40 days later due to grief. Grief over her son or the loss of power? Who knows? At number 7, Jahangir. So this guy was super impatient to become the ruler and was getting tired of Daddy Akbar taking his time. So he revolted. Damn, this court honestly was just rife with rebellion. They never got tired of it. In 1599, while his father was otherwise engaged and away from the palace, Prince Salim led a revolt. During the revolt, he even skinned a man alive. Akbar was pissed about this and wrote to his son and said, quote, I have never skinned a bird alive in my life and you have treated a human being in this manner. Jahangir then went on to conspire against a close advisor of his father named Abul Fazl, whom Jahangir killed in a small battle. Despite Akbar being devastated at his son's behavior, he was the only male heir left to inherit. So on Akbar's deathbed, he forgave his son and implored the nobles to recognize him as a leader. At number 6, so to an ox. Now Jahangir was emperor, but the trouble didn't stop there. I saw some sources recognize him as a somewhat benevolent figure, while others said that he was the exact opposite. He was pretty brutal, and his first task was crushing a rebellion against that which his own son began. Apple, not far from the tree. He was traveling to Lahore when he came across two nobles who were sympathetic to his son's cause. So he decided to punish them in a very peculiar and violent way. He ordered that one be sewed to the skin of an ass and the other to an ox. Now that is messed up. When he got to Lahore to face the rebels, he crushed them and blinded his own son as punishment. A ruler couldn't have any impediments, so therefore his son could no longer pursue the role. Then he hung his son's followers outside of Taxali Gate. Yeah, so even within the confines of war, this guy had some pretty messed up ideas. Number 5. Nothing Left Alexander the Great was an excellent warrior for his time. Having conquered so much at a young age is really quite impressive. His empire stretched from Greece all the way to India. For a history class or a good book, this is fine, but in reality, he was a conqueror. The places he was marching into weren't exactly happy to have spear-wheeling visitors. He laid siege on multiple cities, executed those who defied him, and sold people into YouTube's least favorite S-word. Just about checks off everything a guy needs to be considered a tyrant. History remembers his conquest, but I for sure will not forget how brutal conquerors can really be. Number 4. Chop Chop While Maximilian Robespierre was not a king in the monarch sense, he did hold a lot of political power in France when the political climate was quite messy. Plus, France was at war. But even messier than that is the way he dealt with citizens who were deemed anti-revolution by sending them to the guillotine. Within a one year period, he sent 17,000 people to their dooms via the National Razor, or as it became to be known. He even began practicing deism, something he called the cult of the supreme being. And if you know your history, you know that you can't get away with that forever. And with some sweet poetic justice, Robespierre was sentenced to the guillotine. Number 3. All My Friends Are Dead Usually when people expire, the human thing to do is bury said lifeless human. It's just what we do. 
But apparently Ferdinand I of Naples did not get that memo, instead taking a page from Night at the Museum. No, this is not a cute comedy movie starring Ben Stiller, but in reality a complete horrifying nightmare. Ferdinand took the saying, keep your enemies close, a little too literally, as his favorite form of punishment was to mummify his enemies. Which let's face it, if he's a king, there's gonna be plenty. And he would like to display these mummies in what's probably the coolest place to be if you're into that weird goth stuff. He did keep some alive in the dungeon, but he much preferred his guests embalmed, where he would have them dressed up on display, just as they were before making the mistake of crossing Ferdinand. Now, what's the point of having that hardcore collection if you're not going to show it off? Well, he did. To the people he suspected of treason, which in a place like that, treason leaves your mind pretty quick. Number 2. Average Height for the Time Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the greatest military strategists of his time, maybe of all time. With full support of the French army, Napoleon found himself earning gallant victories one after another, all being accomplished at a very young age. However, after years of grand success in multiple wars and kicking a lot of imperial butt, it started to go to his head. Shortly after the coup that overthrew Robespierre, Napoleon had gained enough support to claim himself as the Emperor of France. With said power, dissolved the freedom of press, reduced the rights of women, and oh yeah, he was at war with most of Europe for years to come. While his military victories cannot be understated, his rise as a tyrannical dictator makes him very unholy. Number 1. Dracula There's been a lot of unholy things said here today, but old Vladdy takes the cake. What he lacked in land and power, he made up for in his brutality. As the legends go, Vlad was creative in his punishments, and was well noted for his human art pieces. And by art, I mean impaling his enemy on pikes, sometimes through their rear ends, and leaving them as warnings for anyone who dared cross him. Similar to the time, visiting envoys wouldn't remove their hats as it is to do in tradition, so Vlad had their hats nailed to their skulls, so that they may never remove them. There are a few other stories that are just too hot for YouTube, but I think he's a textbook example of unholy. He may also be the inspiration for Dracula. Imagine being that much of a monster one is created in your likeness. I mean, just looking at the painting of this guy, it creeps me out, man. Whoa! Number 10. No one's ever really gone. You may have heard that said when losing a family member, a pet, or in the worst Star Wars movies ever made. Sorry, not sorry, Disney. Those are terrible. But perhaps there is someone who is never really gone. Kangas Khan. Yes, that's right. The ruthless Mongol warrior who conquered so much in his time that we're still talking about it today. So, why is this big bad warrior still with us today? Well, that's because of DNA. Yeah, in his time, there was uh, lots of activities going on, besides the usual pillaging the village and unaliving those who oppose you. There were a lot of happy endings, let's say, and by that I mean forced non YouTube friendly conduct bedroom happy ending. So much so that when a study was conducted back in 2003, 8% of men in Asia were thought to be descendants of the mighty man himself. 0.5% worldwide. That doesn't sound like a lot, but we're talking about millions of people here. Next time you go out, you may be brushing shoulders with the warrior's kin. Prepare for battle! Number 9. Henry again? Boy, it's really hard not to talk about this guy, but dude was kinda down bad for it. He's just most well known for his mistreatment of his wives, and by mistreatment, I don't mean getting into a fight over whether or not the toilet seat should be up or down, and then having a very toxic argument in front of family members. No, because when Henry was upset with marriage, he wanted divorce, which honestly was kind of taboo for the time. Oh yeah, and he also beheaded two of his wives because... That's how it goes. I know every couple has their issues to work out, but for most dads out there, having sun drenched beer fueled weekends, they never go beheading after that. Although, dad's been staring at the lawnmower for a while and there's a lot of blades on that. I don't... Dad? While it is true King Henry VIII did behead two wives, he didn't do it to all of them. And at some points were honestly quite pleased with his holy sanctity of marriage. Anyone who's ever been married can tell you how peaceful and sacred that bond really is. Number 8. The People's Princess Okay, I know Prince Charles isn't exactly a king, but he is royalty and the man kinda did Diana dirty. That's a quick and half put together allusion to a Michael Jackson song for the English majors and the audience. Being royalty isn't easy. Being royalty in a modern age when paparazzi overwhelm you with lights and cameras just for a juicy piece of gossip like, when was your last bowel movement? Is it slow? Extra extra, read all about it, the princess is constipated. 
That's just not fun. So after Prince Charles and Princess Diana had been married for a few years, you can understand how excited the media was to find out about their marital disputes. There was three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded, was a quote by Princess Diana that gave the media a field day. Sadly, Prince Charles was having an affair, and it wouldn't be too much longer that Diana would perish in a car accident that may or may not be organized by the royal family themselves. Number 7. Midlife Crisis this one's kind of generalized because if I didn't, I'd have to mention almost every king ever. So here we go. Back in ye olde times, the access to better healthcare just wasn't there. Doctors aren't washing hands. Imagine, buddy eats some greasy mutton and then says, all right, time for your enema. But those aren't the only greasy hands around certain orifices I'm talking about. I'm talking about kings marrying older girls at the ripe age of 12. Yep, that's right. Nothing says experience in womanhood like being 12. People didn't live long, and oftentimes these arranged marriages had ulterior motives, like alliances or business, really. However, that does not make up for marrying a 12 year old who may or may not have started those super weird changing times, like when you were 12 and now there's hair showing up in places that you didn't know there could be hair. I sent a courier to the chief, and he came back with this message It ain't it. Number 6. Till death do us part Love and marriage go together like a horse and carriage, but sometimes the crooning words of Frank Sinatra aren't enough to keep people in love. Sometimes marriages end up like the ones we see on sitcoms, but when there's no laugh track, it's not very funny, and sometimes divorce is the answer. Uh? Medieval Germans thought this too, and something they practiced was divorce by combat. Basically the man goes into a hole with his arm tied behind his back and the woman is free to move around with a sack of rocks. These proceedings are strange as I'm sure no husband or wife married today would ever get so frustrated with one another that they would want to hit one another on the head with rocks. Oh the blessings of being married. Number 5. Queen Isabella I The Spanish Inquisition! Pretty high up there as far as terrifying points in history go. If you weren't willing to convert to Catholicism, you were tormented, interrogated, and burned at the stake. Who was behind this awful time in history? This lady, Queen Isabella I. Technically, as she was fighting for a holy order for the Catholic Church, this can be seen as holy, but was it? Burning people at the stake because they didn't share this belief? Ah, not cool, Isabel. She created a secular government through her reign, which allowed for the monarchy to have more power. Being a pious Catholic, she made Catholicism the official religion and created a tribunal to make this happen. Secret service or a secret police that spread fear wherever they went. Her direct influence caused the Jewish population to falter for a really long time after. Number four, Friedegan of Soissons. Okay, I maybe said that wrong, so I apologize. Kind of impressed with her rise to power. She went from slave attendant to queen. How do you bridge that gap? No idea. Boy was she ferocious. Assassination and manipulation were her main political tools. Fritigan was among a small number of enslaved women in the Merovingian household that became a queen. Merovingian was the OG Central Europe before everything got split up. She survived political dangers and retained her husband's loyalty and could persuade monks and priests to jump onto her plots with ease. She encouraged her husband, the king, to set aside his first wife and then even take the life of his second. But his second wife, Galswinda, had a sister named Brunhild, who became the mortal enemy of Fredegund. She had good reason to be. Fredegund continued to do everything she could to secure her position, one assassination after the next. She was a pretty stormy lady. Number three, Bathory. Okay, okay, okay. All right, technically not a queen, I get it, but she might as well have been with the power that she had. So fight me. She's remembered as the most evil woman in the world in history, I think. I don't know. That's my opinion. Bathory was the stuff of nightmares. Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560 into a prominent Hungarian noble family, making her practically untouchable. She married a very famous war hero who is suspected of gifting Bloody Lizzie with the skills she used to kill. After she died, Bathory became obsessed with immortality. Supposedly when one of her servants accidentally spilt blood on her and her skin appeared younger after. Bathory then began her mission of horror, luring over 650 young virgin women to her palace and brutally taking their lives. She was even bold enough to lure daughters of nobility. Before draining them of their blood, she would make them suffer in ways you don't even want to imagine before bathing in the blood itself. When she was finally caught, three of her servants were executed, but she was simply locked away in her tower for the rest of her days on house arrest. 
Ugh. Number two, Catherine de Medici, also known as the Serpent Queen. History colors her story as the tale of the evil queen. On one hand, she is remembered for being one of the most powerful French queens in history, and then on the other, she was blamed for the many atrocities that took place during her reign. Her regency was marked by the French wars of religion and the many games Catherine played within them. The Catholics and the Protestants, as previously mentioned, were at war, and she spent a lot of time trying to find peace. Kind of. But she was a passionate Catholic and is believed to have tried to remove a Protestant general from her son's side. When he survived the attack, she lied and convinced her son that the Protestants were responsible, so she scapegoated them. So he authorized taking the lives of their leaders. Enter St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Catherine implicated the general, which resulted in him being the first to be beaten and then tossed out of his own bedroom window. An estimated 3,000 French Protestants were taken out in Paris, but the total countrywide was around 70,000. And last but not least, Bloody Mary, actually known as Queen Mary the First of England. So no, I'm not talking about the girl you say in the mirror three times so that she appears and you're like, wow, I'm haunted forever. Queen Mary became known as Bloody Mary due to her vicious tirade against Protestants in England during her reign. She even imprisoned her own sister, Elizabeth, who we mentioned at the beginning of this list, due to suspicions of treason. This was unfounded. She bore her father Henry VIII ill will after the stuff he pulled with the church and after having delegitimized her as his heir for a time. After Mary took the throne and married the Catholic King of Spain, she began carrying out her plan for England to become Catholic once again. In 1555, she revived England's heresy laws and began burning offenders at the stake, starting with her father's longtime advisor, Thomas Kramer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. She burned over 300 convicted heretics, most of them being common citizens, and dozens more died in prison, hence giving her the name of Bloody Mary. Number 10, the young czar. Being the leader of a nation is hard. I play a lot of city builders, trust me, I know. Being the leader of a nation whose people have been brutally oppressed by your family's dynasty for 300 years and in general living in very poor conditions, especially compared to the rest of the world, that's hard too, even harder. Nicholas II inherited the throne from his father, which sounds great, but in reality was a lot of pressure to do so. As it turns out, Russia was in need of drastic change, and they would get it from the people and a bald man with very pointy facial hair. A communist revolution saw the empire of Russia fall. 300 years of Romanov rule end overnight, as the Tsar was forced to abdicate his throne. So what's his crime? Well, not doing anything. Negligence. He did so much nothing that people had to do something. Number 9, Nero Steam. We've talked about Emperor Nero quite a lot on this channel, but that's because he's the down bad Roman Emperor who puts opulence in Pax Romana. It's hard to pinpoint an exact crime or moment from him, as he's the guy you think about when you think of Roman Emperors. However, his crimes against his wife Claudia Octavia are very notable. So when Nero was getting remarried, he had to get rid of Octavia. I mean, you can't, you can't have like 40 wives, wait, that's, you gotta get rid of her. But how? I mean, how do you get rid of a woman like that? He actually did the whole uh, James Bond villain thing where the victim gets placed into a trap. Uh, it's very crude, but theatrical, because remember, that's, theatrics are important, remember that, folks. Hence, Octavia was banished to an island where shortly after she was locked into a vapor bath, where she suffocated. Naturally, to make himself look better, uh, they made it look like uh, they made it look like she did it, not him. So yeah, what a great guy! What a what an absolute hero in that story. Definitely not a villain. Number eight, Abzal Khan. Everyone remembers King Henry VIII for doing what he did to his wives. A naughty slap on the wrist, naughty. Don't do that. For shame. However, I would like to offer Abzal Khan as the alternative monster here. He, he didn't unalive a handful of wives like Henry, no, no. He actually managed to rack up a count of 63. Yep, you heard me right, 63. First off, I don't know how you have that many wives and or remember names, let alone birthdays and anniversaries. I would not do very well in that situation. Well, what's the reason for all this blood spilling? It's pretty horrible, actually. Simply because he was being invaded, and the guy who was invading him and winning was slightly nicer to women and was going to most likely give them a better life. Jeez, talk about if I can't have it, no one can. God. Number seven, Caligula's wife. I think in a healthy relationship, you ought to put your partner on a pedestal. Maybe your partner is drop dead gorgeous, a promising athlete, or really enjoys building Legos. Nice tie fighter, babe, way to go. Yeah. 
Emperor Caligula of Rome liked to put his wife on a pedestal, literally. And while on this pedestal, she was wearing nothing but her birthday suit. Oh boy. Well, all of his friends, politicians, generals got to gawk and stare at her. And in some weird goth power flex, he would oftentimes hold a knife to her and tell her that he could just end her life whenever he wanted because he can do that. Not to mention the guy had a complete narcissist complex, building statues of himself everywhere just so she can, like, oh great, there he is again. It's him again. Number six, Kangas Khan. I bring the man up again because he's responsible for so much loss, so much blood spill, so much pain. Sure, they were effective warriors and archers, but they were, they were brutal, dude, especially him. They took what they wanted when they wanted, and it's said that he was responsible for so many lives lost that it affected the carbon footprint of the planet. Dude, that's insane. That is literally insane. Also, to note his treatment of rather... Uh, well, mistreatment of women. YouTube won't let me say much, but I can tell you that these ladies were not inviting him into their bedrooms. It wasn't, uh, wasn't good. As it stands today, because of his bedroom misconduct, his DNA still lives on. 5% of men worldwide share his DNA. Number five, big money. This is no surprise to anyone, I'm sure, but back in the day, I'd argue the division between wealth and poor was larger than today. Kings had it all. I mean, if you listen to what Taylor's saying, he, he knows what he's talking about. Food, water, power, what else is there? Well, how about the coinage to make it all happen? The bread, the guap, the dosh, and my favorite, the cheddar. Yes, that's right, the ancient king's wealth. Whatever they didn't already possess, they could take by force or simply just bought with incalculable riches. With uncalculable riches, so much money, they had so much money. I can't make it clear, they had a lot of money. A great example of this was Mansa Musa, a very wealthy king from the Mali Empire. It's speculated he might have been the wealthiest person to ever walk the face of the earth. Earning his riches through the trading of gold and salt, he decided to show the international community how rich he was and went on tour, because that's just something you do when you have millions of dollars, I guess. Where in multiple cities, he spent and gave away so much gold that it upset the city's economies. That is, that is, a, that is a big flex, okay. Donald Trump might have hotels, but Mansa Musa has everything else. It's kind of like Monopoly when one player has a boatload of cash and they go from one good property to the next. So even if they land on something, they get all the cold hard so even if they land on something, they got all the cold hard cash to deal with it. Plus they also have some good property and they just make it back every turn anyway. I'm fed up with Monopoly. Number four, King of Castles. King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tale castles. Yeah, let's call this inspiration, I guess. What a privilege this ought to be. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the King of Bavaria back in 1864. And then he had castles built as, you know, he was inspired from romantic literature and spending time at the opera. You hear that, Andrew? He was inspired after the opera. What a poet. It's crazy. Crazy. Must be nice, right? King Ludwig II would spend his nights in one castle, looking through his fancy telescope, admiring the next castle being built. What a, what? Who, ha? He even freestyled the castle as well. Yeah, just four years in, the guy designed his own majestical castle. And to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world, so clearly he did something right. New Schwinstein Castle, literal fairy tale. There we go. Meanwhile, I'm over here making castles in Minecraft. Still fun, we'll take it. Number three, jousting. First there is bread, and then there is wine, and then there is entertainment. You can't tell me why a delicious plate of nachos dances like a ballerina in your microwave, you didn't pull up some super cool content to watch on your phone. Maybe featuring a large, kind of funny comedian, and maybe also featuring a super handsome, tall, funny comedian with a neck thing, I don't know. Kings of Yieldy Times did not possess the power of the internet or watching fail videos, so watching combat sports was the next best thing. Oh, what's that I hear? Watching the sport isn't enough? Well, some royalty even got involved. King Henry VIII, for example, just loved to joust because because he did. He even had an accident with such, and it's what might have made him gone mad in the first place. Number two, banning coffee. This is the worst of the worst, people. Here we go. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee. What a monster. I would be asleep right now if coffee wasn't a thing. He was born in 1612, and for the most part, his mother was ruling through him because he was so young and all. But when he got a little older, he got a little wiser, he put forth these laws, punishable by death, may I add, in order to get things back on track. That was the key. The guy banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. What a, what a fun guy. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian at nighttime and then wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades just wandering the roads. 
If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather Murad IV himself would just take off his hood and be like, surprise, and then he would take off your head right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All that for some stale ale. What a monster. Number one, groom of the stool. For some reason, this job was considered to be higher up, a well-respected job, if you will. However, I'd like to ask the man in charge of such an operation how he felt. Imagine, I can imagine he wasn't too fond of his job. Hands never clean, hands never clean. The groom of the stool is someone who would assist the king in his bathroom duties by supplying fresh water, towels, and whatever a king needs. He may have also been responsible for cleaning the forbidden starfish. May the divines of Skyrim have mercy on his soul. I guess this had to be done, but I don't know if I could ever even do that to another human being. If you've ever eaten Taco Bell late at night and washed it down with some Baja Blast, then you know the kind of explosion awaits the porcelain throne in the morning. So yes, having a servant present at your bowel movements is a privilege that most other folks just didn't have, but would you really want one? Number 10, King Midas. Most people know the story of King Midas, but in a nutshell, he was a king who was granted the power of the everything he touched turned to solid gold. So, no, he didn't exactly buy anything with that kind of power, but the man can have anything he wants or buy anything he wants. It's a lot of gold. This sounds great, but it's really awful for a couple of reasons. One, that is pretty much the moral of the story, and the other is, well, some basic uh, economy stuff. The first reason this would suck is that one, you should never be too greedy, and you really shouldn't. And you should always be careful what you wish for. This blessing quickly turned into a curse as Midas could no longer eat. Which, that's bad. Not eating and everything touch turn to gold. Oh, you couldn't hug anybody, it's terrible. The other issue would be his wealth. You'd have to be very careful on how many items you actually touched, as producing too much gold would eventually devalue the price of gold. Especially if you touch a bed or something, that, that's, that's a lot of gold. Imagine how much a solid gold bed would weigh, or how much that would be worth. So in reality, you would be both starving and poor. Number nine, Mansa Musa. Sort of related to the King Midas issue, Mansa Musa was probably the richest man to ever walk the face of the earth. A king from Northern Africa who exploited his country's salt and gold reserves. His estimated wealth today would be around the $400 billion mark. $400 billion US, ooh, that's a lot of money. Tough to actually measure it exactly because it was from so long ago, but it could be less, and some say it could actually even be more. Mansa Musa went on tour one year to see all the beautiful things he could of the ancient world, and you can't take a little vacation without buying something at the gift shop. Mansa Musa was so rich and spent so much money in a few towns that he visited that he single-handedly upset the economy of those cities. Elon Musk wishes he could. So he basically bought a lot of stuff, and it was unusual because it upset the economy. Like, he destroyed the economy of those downs. That's insane. Number eight, Michael Jackson, the king of pop. Ah, see, I got you. I pulled a sneaky on you. But yeah, he's still a king. And maybe he was the biggest celebrity who ever lived. Would Halloween really be Halloween without Thriller? And how could cool guys let you know they were cool in the 80s if they didn't have all that leather jacket and stuff? You wouldn't be able to know. You just wouldn't. Well, maybe some things you don't know about Michael Jackson were his shopping habits. The man loved shopping. And with that kind of money, well, you can do anything. Well, some may remember his chimp, his Neverland Mansion, complete with carnival rides and arcade, and even an oxygen chamber in case Darth Vader was coming over to stay the night. However, something very strange the man tried to do was he tried to buy a very strange man himself, or rather his bones. For some reason, Michael had a fascination with the Elephant Man, a man with severe facial deformities and freak show performer from the late 1800s. Michael tried to purchase his remains. That's it. That's the point. He tried to buy him. They wouldn't let him, but he tried. That's a weird thing to buy. I've never, when I, whenever I hit the number, I don't go, hey, 1-800-Museum people, someone bring me King Tot. I want it. Number seven, Elvis Presley. Lots of similarities today. Elvis Presley, before Michael Jackson, he was probably the most famous person to ever exist. The king of rock and roll, baby, that's right. All I'll say is phone your grandma and ask her how she feels about him. She probably says she loves his music and those gyrating hips. At the time, it was pretty controversial. Boy, only if they knew what was going on today. Whew. Sorry, 50s Atomic families. Well, being that Elvis Presley was the king and the first celebrity to be idolized the way we do with modern celebrities, he became quite wealthy. Well, with all that money, he bought some weird things, including a chimp. Everyone's buying a monkey. They want a zoo. I don't know. A mansion property he named Graceland, a pink Cadillac for his mother, and strangely enough, he bought FDR's yacht. 
Yeah, what? That's so weird. Good president, sure, but does it really have room for a monkey in a pink Cadillac? I don't know. Number six, French royalty. This one is more about Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI. It's kind of like a two-pack, kind of like a couple, but trust me, it all makes sense in the end. Uh, but it, again, and anything they bought, it was probably the king's wallet, wasn't it? Okay, so when your country is starving, demanding more rights, and in general, life really sucks, what's the next best thing you do? Buy a $12 million necklace. Yeah, right, okay, I've said that before, sure. Okay, Chad, what else? Continue to live your opulent life on the kings and people's dimes. Sure, why not? It makes sense, okay. I'm talking too much. Well, something I learned today and something that Taylor showed me is that I guess the last Queen of France was a little lonely. So what did King Louis do to fix this? Spend more time with her? Nay. Buy her a new dog? Nay, sir and madams. He had her pug from Austria imported to the country. And anyone can tell you that when something is imported, you are going to be dishing out a few more dosh. Yes, that's right. They imported her pug from Austria. Imagine how that sounds when your house is literally falling apart, you're starving and you pay the most taxes. Makes you want to put heads on pikes. That's what it makes you want to do. Can you imagine that? We're all poor and hungry. She's like, well, look at my dog. It's my dog. They're French. They don't sound like that, but this is my dog. Look at my dog. Here he is. <laughs> In our number five spot today, we have Nero. For this one, we are going to be taking it all the way back to the age of the Roman Empire. When we think back to these times, they weren't necessarily the most kind, peaceful times, but there certainly are some characters that stand out as being particularly brutal, and one of those is Nero. Throughout his reign, he wreaked havoc on the Roman Empire. He burned cities. He killed thousands of people, including every member of his own family, and I mean, we know the inventive execution methods of the past, so you can probably guess at just how brutal all of these were. Most Roman sources give us an almost completely negative review of him in reference to both his personality as well as his reign as a leader. He was called compulsive and corrupt, and it is believed that he is actually to blame for the great fire that burned Rome, but instead he used the Christians as a scapegoat so that they would receive punishments rather than him. In the end, after being declared a public enemy by the Roman Senate and realizing that the rebellion would be lost, he ended up taking his own life at the age of 30. In our number four spot today, we have Pol Pot. Pol Pot was the leader of the Cambodian revolutionary group called the Khmer Rogue, and this group, with him at the forefront, went on to try and destroy the Cambodian civilization. This wasn't necessarily how the group started out, but once Paul and others who shared his ideals came to lead it, things quickly became very dark. He is likely one of the only people who ordered a mass jet in his own country. The reasoning behind all of this is because he believed that destroying the civilization was the best way to start a new regime and bring in a new age. He ended up serving as the Prime Minister from 1976 until 1979, during which his policies led to the deaths of around 2 million people, which is horrifying. That was about 25% of the entire population. He even liked to keep the skulls of those he had killed. Just gonna say, it seems as though politics was the mask for someone who just really wanted to kill people. There are so many horrific details surrounding him and the things he did, much of which I can't even repeat here on YouTube, and that is exactly how he landed a spot here on today's list. He truly did some horrendous things, and in the end, went on to live the rest of his life and died of natural causes before he could even answer for any of his crimes, which is just the most frustrating end to a horrible tale. In our number three spot today, we have Maximilian Robespierre. Pierre. Okay, I'll be honest. This is quite a polarizing one. Maximilian, on one hand, was great. He advocated for universal suffrage, for unrestricted admission to national posts, and he was against racial and religious discrimination. Especially in the time he ruled in, this was huge. Of course people were against him, but in our modern views, he was way ahead of his time in these beliefs. On the other hand, however, he was extremely violent and was the leader during most of the French reign of terror that happened during the revolution. It is said that during this time, he was responsible for imprisoning somewhere around 300,000 and killing somewhere around 40,000. During the revolution in 1793, he was elected head of the Committee of Public Safety, and from that point on, any voice that was in opposition to the change that was happening was struck down and silenced by him. Throughout the years, his ego and power only grew, which led to him being a little too quick to use the guillotine, his favorite execution method. He was getting a little too cozy with that thing, so much 
so that he began to use it even on people who had, at one time, been his allies. We saw this clearly when it came to the execution of George Danton, who Maximilian had executed after he suggested maybe chilling out on the whole reign of terror thing. In the end, people caught on to this tendency for violence and horrible punishments, which definitely lost some of his public support, and this was only exacerbated when it was realized that he now had beliefs that directly contradicted those he had earlier, like when he tried to create a national religion called the Cult of the Supreme Being. By the time 1794 came around, he was overthrown, and later that year he found himself being executed by you guessed it, the guillotine. Not good, no thanks. In our number two spot today, we have Vlad Tepes. Often referred to as Vlad the Impaler, he was the ruler of Wallachia three times between 1448 until his death in 1476. He is often regarded as one of the most important rulers in Wallachian history, and to many he is a hero, and this is not to disregard that. But you don't get a nickname like the Impaler by being a passive, peaceful guy. Vlad was known for his brutality and his love of impaling people, but it is also said that everyone's favorite vampire, Dracula, was modeled after him. This is because it is rumored that Vlad liked to dip his bread in the blood of his enemies before eating it. I prefer a little olive oil and balsamic vinegar with mine, but hey, to each his own, I guess. Vlad is known for his intimidation tactics, which included having bodies of those he had killed lined up outside of the city so that any enemies approaching would know what fate they had coming. Like I mentioned before, many regard Vlad as a hero. I mean, it is abundantly clear that he fought as hard as he could to protect Romania and Bulgaria from the Ottomans, but that doesn't mean that the horrific things he did have been forgotten either. Vlad definitely left quite the legacy behind when he was killed in 1476. In our number one spot today, we have Joseph Stalin. Stalin was a Georgian revolutionary and Soviet political leader who governed the Soviet Union from 1922 until his death in 1953. Despite the fact that he started his time governing the country as a part of a collective leader, by the 1930s, he had consolidated all of the power and went on to begin acting as the Soviet Union's dictator. During his reign, Stalin was responsible for the deaths of over 60 million people, 20 million of them being his own. Apparently, the math works out to about 40,000 people per week, which is just unbelievable. For almost 30 years, he reigned the Soviet Union with terror and violence. I mean, his decisions led to a famine that killed millions of people. Also, the lives he took weren't just of his enemies. I mean, how could one person have 60 million enemies? He would take the lives of families of people he liked. He just took too many lives, was too paranoid, and while he was powerful and smart, he could also be an absolute monster. This is all perfectly summed up when he said, quote, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is simply a statistic. At number 10, the king of hobbies. Everyone has their interests, right? Like for example, I like video games and I like watching people scream at their teammates for not helping everyone else out. I'm looking at you, Blake. For kings back in the day, they didn't have people on Rocket League to scream at, so they had to find other interests. For Tsar Peter the Great, he had a lot of interests and they were all very bizarre. Firstly, he had an obsession with short people, especially dwarves. To him, they were like his real life dolls or something and he would hold weddings for them and even hold lavish funerals, complete with small horses pulling a small coffin on a carriage, and even a very short priest to hold the ceremony. But other than this obsession with short people, he also dabbled a bit in medicine. He liked watching surgeries be performed like he was trying to be on Grey's Anatomy or something, but when watching the surgeries just wasn't enough for him, he would sometimes perform them himself. Now remember, He's not a doctor, so it's no surprise to learn that these surgeries rarely ever went well and people died. I certainly wouldn't trust him to give me any kind of surgery, but he was a king so he could do whatever he wanted. Peter the Great also loved dentistry. It is said that if you wanted to get all buddy buddy with the king, all you had to do was let him pull your tooth. Sounds like the guy was one heartbreak away from starting his own medical drama, but in the worst way. Number nine, banning coffee. This is the worst of the worst, people. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee. Coffee, like an absolute monster. No more triple triples for you. He was born in 1612 and for the most part, his mother was ruling through him because he was so young. That's often the case with most of these young rulers. They just get, hey, you're seven, now you rule a kingdom, enjoy. It's, you know, it's tough, they're not gonna know what's going on. But when he got a little bit older, he put forth these laws, punishable by death, 
might I add, in order to get things back on track, that was the key. He banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian during the nighttime and would wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather, Murad IV himself would take your head off right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All because you're drinking a Bud Light Lime. At number eight, why are you mad? Now this could be a bit of a controversial opinion, but if your name includes the words the mad, I would assume that you're not doing too great, right? I mean, you have to earn that title, and if it's a title that harsh, that simply begs the question, what in the H-E double hockey sticks did you do to get that name? Well, for Charles the Mad, he did a lot. Charles became king when he was only 11 years old, so that certainly didn't help his development and knowing this kind of helps explain a lot of his actions. He was known for getting really angry and throwing fits of rage and was known to give people the gift of the big sleep, if you know what I mean. Charles didn't always kill people though, only sometimes. Other times he liked to switch things up. Sometimes he would run around his palace pretending to be a wolf. Other times he would go through phases where he just really didn't want to keep up with his personal hygiene and he would get so gross that he literally had to be cut out of his own clothes. Now, I don't know how long you have to go without bathing to get to that point, but really, I don't think I want to know the answer to that question. Charles also thought that he was made of glass, and so he would go through phases where he would sit completely still so that he didn't break. Kind of like Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy, but not as, you know, extraterrestrial. Well, maybe he was. That honestly would explain a lot. Number seven, party hard. Zhu Huzhao was the emperor of the Ming Dynasty in the early 1500s. Now, lately we've been talking about kings and queens, we're on part twos for both now, and there's a good amount who simply just aren't ready. They're too young to rule. Like Joffrey from Game of Thrones. Kings like that actually existed. They were horrible. They were young, they were too young to know what was right and wrong. Plus, they usually have some corrupt parents whispering in their ears the entire time. Zhu took the throne at just age 14, and for a while, ministers were confident that he would grow into the role and become the leader that he was born to be. Well, when he got older, he transformed a zoo just outside of Beijing. He transformed it into his own personal brothel. Yum. I mean, on one hand, I'm glad the animals are free, but like, a zoo? You couldn't find a more romantic place? Can convert an Applebee's to a brothel, maybe? I don't know, something with AC? His final days were spent partying, and some would say a little bit too hard. He got intoxicated and fell from a boat. That's how he ended his life. Honestly, not a bad way to go out. Pretty OG. At number six, love game. A lot of kings and queens throughout history have been known to engage in the horizontal hustle a lot. I mean, when you're a ruler of a kingdom, you don't really have much to do in your spare time. So what else are you gonna do? Play a board game? No. These monarchs were getting busy all the time, but there was one king who was just so obsessed with getting a good old pickle tickle that it just became his whole personality. King Philip V was known to be a nymphomaniac, and he liked doing the deed a lot, but because at the time, the Catholic Church said that having sexy time with anyone but your spouse was a sin, the king and his wife were getting busy all the time. Eventually, his first wife caught on to how to use this to her advantage, and she would often refuse to sleep with him until she got her way with anything she suggested or demanded from him. You would think that he would catch on to this game, but maybe his urges were just so strong because he always caved and gave her what he wanted. Obviously, this man did not follow Hoodville. Absolutely not. Just to give you guys an idea of how obsessed this guy was, when his wife was on her deathbed, before she went eh, he literally tried to get one last bang in. On her deathbed. Like, dude, not the time. In our number five spot today, we have Albert Fall. Albert Fall was the Secretary of the Interior to former President Warren G. Harding, and while in this position, he decided to secretly allow oil companies to tap into the Teapot Dome Oil Reserve in Wyoming and the Elk Hills Oil Reserve in California. Of course, the reason he did this is because he could make a ton of extra money doing this, like several hundred thousand dollars. This all started to unravel, though, in 1922, when there was an expose that revealed that the oil had been sold without any sort of competitive bidding. After this expose, Robert La Follette, who was a senator from Wisconsin, created an investigation into the story by the Senate Committee on Public Lands. The Attorney General at the time, Harry Dougherty, began to get some flack for not investigating this alleged corruption, so Harry turned to the FBI director to help him out. The FBI director, William J. Burns, sent an agent to Robert, the senator from Wisconsin's office, to search for anything that 
could be used to blackmail him into stopping the investigation into the corruption. Despite this seemingly obvious threat, Robert knew that this meant that his investigation was going to reveal something serious, which motivated him to continue on with it. In the end, the shady dealings and all of the bribery was revealed and Albert Fall was officially exposed. This entire ordeal led to him being the first United States cabinet secretary to go to prison. In our number four spot today, we have Velvely Dickinson. Velvely is a name I've never heard before, and I thought it sounded kind of cool and nice until I heard about the person it belonged to. Velvely is one of the reasons why we should never judge a book by its cover. On the outside, she appeared to be like a regular older lady who ran a doll store. Who would think the owner of a doll store would ever be a villain? Okay, maybe everyone. But anyway, as far as I know, everything started out more normal, but once her husband passed away from a heart attack, things took a very sinister twist as she started to take on some interesting side projects for a little extra cash. In 1942, the FBI was able to intercept a letter that was on its way to Buenos Aires. The letter spoke of a quote, wonderful doll hospital and quote, three old English dolls. And the FBI was like, hey, that's kind of weird. So their cryptographers went to work and it was uncovered that this letter was actually sent in code. As it turns out, these letters were actually sending military secrets to Japan and some of the information within them would have been extremely valuable if the letter hadn't been intercepted and never delivered. Turns out that Velvely had visited the Japanese Institute in New York, befriended the Consul General and connected with a Japanese naval attache. The FBI arrested Dickinson and upon doing so, they found huge amounts of cash along with the instructions for the code she was to use in the letters. She ended up being sentenced to 10 years in prison. In our number three spot today, we have Monica Witt. Monica is a former United States Air Force technical sergeant as well as defense contractor who has been on the run since 2018. Despite her high ranking position and high security clearance, she is on the run because she defected to Iran in 2013. It is said that from 2013 up until she was found out that she was using her position in order to spy on the United States and relate that information back to the group she was working for. She used different fake Facebook accounts and it is said that the information she gave included the classified true name and counterintelligence activities of a US intelligence operative. This is of course a problem regardless of how important this operative was, but it is said that this information she shared had the potential to cause serious damage to United States national security. It truly is an absolutely wild story and Monica is still out there on the run hiding from the consequences of her betrayal and espionage. In our number two spot today, we have Irene of Athens. Taking it back to the Byzantine Empire, Irene of Athens was the mother of Constantine VI, and while the pair co-ruled together for almost two decades, things ended in quite the tragedy. After the pair co-ruled, Irene did go on to rule on her own from 797 to 802 CE, but you might be wondering how she managed to outrule her son. Well, Irene, the ambitious ruler, wanted full control all to herself, so she asked for the help of some political allies to pull off a scheme against her own son. She began to lead a conspiracy against him to try and get him out of power. The duo did end up reconciling their relationship, but this is not where the story ends. In 786, the public began to turn their backs on Constantine because he had decided to divorce his wife and instead marry his mistress. Irene saw this as a second chance and once again chose to conspire against her own son. Honestly, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, this lady did not care. Here's where things in the story get exceptionally gorgeous though. Irene not only ordered the arrest of her son, but also ordered that his eyes be gouged out. Yep, that's how good old Mumsy came into power. Finally, in our number one spot today, we have Boy Jones. Okay, I've heard of people being called Boy Jones before, but little did I know Boy Jones was a very real and very creepy person. His full name was Edward Jones, and this little rascal basically stalked the Queen from 1838 to 1841. He managed to break into Buckingham Palace, and we aren't just talking about once, we are talking about many many times. He knew exactly where to go and what to do, and once in the castle, well, he would hide under the queen's sofa, he would sit on her throne, and worst of all, he would go through her clothing, like a little creep. He even went as far as to steal her clothes, which is just stupid, of course. Taking evidence of your crimes is bad practice. Thankfully, he did finally get caught, but man, a few years of sneaking in and sitting on the throne. That's crazy. At number 10, Royal Enemas. 
Apparently, back in the day, enemas were all the rage amongst the elite. It was believed that enemas were good for your health, so everyone was doing it to try and live a little longer than the rest of those commoners and peasants. One person who really just couldn't get enough enemas in his life was King Louis XIV. It is believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. When I tell you this guy was obsessed, I'm not kidding. One year, Louis received 212 enemas in just the one year. And of course, he had to make his enemas a little jazzy and couldn't just use water like any other person. Oh no. My guy was using things like almond milk. His enemas were also sometimes scented with orange or rose and sometimes even colored just to make it a little more special. To get an idea of just how obsessed the elite were with receiving enemas, just think about the fact that a French duchess once received one during a court ball. The duchess was in the middle of having a conversation with Louis XIV and during this conversation, Conversation, one of her maids came over, snuck under her dress, and gave the duchess an enema on the spot. Ew. These people were so weird. At number 9, Pampered Pony. I'm sure I can speak for most people when I say when you have a pet, you love and care for that thing like it is your child, right? Well, one Roman emperor might have taken that concept a little bit too far because saying that he was obsessed with his horse is an understatement. The Roman emperor known as Caligula had a horse named Incitatus. Caligula was a horse racing enthusiast, so Incitatus was his pride and joy, and not too many people were all that thrilled about it, to be honest. When I tell you this horse was treated better than most people have ever been. I'm not kidding. The horse's stall was made out of marble, his manger was made out of ivory, and he was even fed oats flaked with gold. Caligula was also very adamant about his horse receiving a good and restful sleep before a race, and he was so serious about it that he made guards stand outside of the horse's stable to make sure that the horse remained undisturbed while it slept. This horse even had its own furniture. Like, what is he gonna do with it? He's a horse. Caligula was so fond of his horse that he even made it a priest and promised to make him consul, which was the lead position in the Roman government after the emperor, highly coveted by senators. This was the last straw for people because the emperor was putting his horse above his own people, so he was assassinated. Now before I carry on telling you guys about the wild and crazy things that kings did back in the day, I would like to first ask you guys to consider leving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and also maybe think about subscribing as well to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Mumia Medicine It's safe to say that medicine from the past is very different from modern times. These days we have pharmaceuticals to treat illnesses, but back in the days of old there were very different and quite questionable methods of treating ailments, and one of those methods included cannibalism. In the 16th and 17th centuries, it was common practice for elites like priests, kings, and other nobles to consume remedies that included human bones, blood, and fat as medicine to treat ailments from headaches to epilepsy. And this practice was called mummia medicine. At first, it started with people using Egyptian mummies and skulls from Irish graves for use in medicine, as bones would be ground and used in different tinctures for various uses. But soon, other parts of the body started to be used. Human and fat was later used to treat ailments on the outside of the body, and blood would be consumed as well as it was believed to contain the vitality of life. Several monarchs were known to use mummia medicine, like Charles II and William II of England, Francois I of France, and Christian IV of Denmark. At number 7, Kissing Sheets For thousands of years, monarchs worried about the threat of being poisoned by their enemies, and so they thought of an array of precautions to take in order to prevent being taken out by some kind of spicy death sauce or something. Many monarchs hired tasters to try their food before it was given to the king to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, but some monarchs were also afraid of being poisoned through something that they touched. This is why Henry VIII hired someone with a very important job to make sure that his bed wasn't poisoned. The person who was tasked with making the king's bed was also required to kiss every part of his bed in the morning. They would kiss the pillows, sheets, and blankets to prove that someone hadn't smeared poison on it. The king was also concerned with people poisoning clothing too, so his clothes as well as his son's clothes were also tested for poison before getting dressed. At number 6, Eternal Youth I know that there are a lot of people out there who want to live forever. I am one of those people. 
I am afraid of dying, but I also want to see what humanity will look like many, many years from now until the sun consumes the earth. Unfortunately, that's kind of impossible, at least for now, until we come up with some kind of way to make people live longer. But this idea of prolonging your life has been around for thousands of years, and one Chinese emperor was super obsessed with the idea and really tried his best to live for at least another 10,000 years. Emperor Ying Zhang was obsessed with finding a magic elixir that would make him live longer, and he demanded that his subjects find this immortality elixir for him. Now, even though he brought a lot of prosperity to people during his rule, he never let go of his demand for immortality, and it put a lot of pressure on his underlings to find him something to help him live forever, but obviously that didn't happen. He was so concerned with his lifespan that he even brought magicians into his court. His obsession alienated him from his people, and after all of that effort trying to live longer, he died at the age of 49. Number five, George V. Turned out this guy loved stamps. Maybe a bit too much though, I'd say. It was almost distracting. It was taking up many hours of his day. Like, you know, focus on other things. Like say maybe, I don't know, the war. King George V continued to collect stamps during World War I. Everyone's trying to stay alive. George is just in the background like. Like all collections, they started at an early age. It's now at a point where it's just, you know, past impressive and borderline strange. Especially if you're a royal, like you're really going hard with this. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages, full of stamps. That's 20,000 pages full of stamps. That's a lot, way too many stamps. So naturally, he was nicknamed the King of Stamps, or rather the King of Philately. That's the official term for collecting stamps. We're historians here, we have to make it official. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record Ho ho! The most money ever spent on a stamp. This guy dropped like 220,000 on one single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about the fool who had spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp. And he was proud. He was like, oh, that fool? It was I. Number four. Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor from 1552. He was known as a collector. Yeah, some princes collected stamps, others collect zoo animals. We're all different. Yeah, his castle was home to lions, tigers, and not bears, but orangutans. So good luck getting your eight hours. He also collected human artifacts, like body parts after they've been, you know, so that's, watch your step, I guess. Welcome to MTV Cribs. Don't mind the jar of eyes. Watch out for the lion's tail. Careful, what a mess. He's quite important in history though, I guess. He supported the scientific revolution and he also poured tons of money into astrology, so next time you read your horoscope, remember it's Bones in the Jar Benny that's responsible for that one. And also, in case you're wondering, yeah, he didn't pay attention to any of his wives or anything like that. He was just, no, nope, jars for me, jars and animals, I'm all set. Number three, Don Carlos. Spanish crown prince, the guy who just enjoyed being the worst human alive. Let's talk about him. Back in the mid 1500s, the eldest son to King Philip II of Spain was, yeah, I want to say worse things, but he was just a really bad person. YouTube, he was just a bad guy. Now, it's been noted that he was born with a hunchback and one leg was shorter than the other. Historians like to bring that up first and how maybe he had the odds against him with these disabilities growing up and people often feel bad for him a little. To that, I say don't. Nah, don't do it. Don Carlos was made hero of the opera by his dad. Dude was fine. Philip II of Spain? Yeah, he would hurt a lot of people. He would hurt animals and people just for fun. According to historians, Don Carlos once made a cobbler eat a pair of boots because he didn't like how the pair of boots looked. He made somebody eat boots. We're not gonna feel bad for him on Bumblebee today. That's not what we're gonna do. He was also set up to marry Queen Elizabeth of Valois, the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours, she was like, no, that's not gonna happen, no way. So she married his father instead. That's what happens, that's what happens when you're in 1564, a few brides were lined up for Don Carlos. Mary, Queen of Scots, was one of them. Margaret of Valois, we know what happened with her, and Anna of Austria. But his mental conditions grew worse and it went south. Shocker. Number two, Heart of Glass. King Charles VI, once nicknamed the Beloved and then quickly nicknamed the Mad. What happened? After he became King of France in 1380, he would have these episodes, let's call them. He would believe he was made of glass and he didn't want anybody to touch him. He had this glass delusion, which was surprisingly not uncommon, believe it or not, for this time period. Believing you were made out of glass in some way, shape, or form, be it in your head, butt, shoulders, or back, really spiked around the mid-1400s. And Charles VI, aka Charles the Mad, he wouldn't let anybody, not even his wife, near him at all. 
I'm not making fun of somebody for having a fear like that. I mean, most likely historians believe he was schizophrenic, so obviously I'm not ripping on that. But Alexandria of Bavaria, another royal who had this glass delusion, she too believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass, so she had to enter rooms sideways to avoid it shattering. I don't know what's going on with this glass delusion, but I'm glad it went away, I don't know. And finally, number one, King George IV. Voted as England's worst king by historians. So that should already tell you a good amount of this guy. George was another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his, you know, intimate side quests, if you know what I'm saying here, like all these other kings we've talked about. He was a bit busy being a stupid fool. This man was trying literally everything to get a woman to sleep with him. Although he was the king and he was already set up, he was like, nope, I'm gonna go and keep trying with strangers and random. And he would throw a tantrum if they said no, or he would threaten to end his own life if he didn't get the girl. Like, you know what I'm saying? One of those kind of monsters. He would also keep uh, trophies, lack of a better term, of all these conquests afterwards. He would ask each people that he slept with for a little piece of hair and then he would keep them, he would like store them. Back then it was kind of common, I guess, for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, weirdly enough, because you don't have phone numbers or like any sort of way to remember someone, photos, I don't know. So you kept their hair. But after the king died, his brother found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. So yeah, I'll leave you on that note. I think there's a hair in my mouth, that's kind of gross. Number 10, what a drag. Bachelor number one. What would you do if I refused to marry you? Well, I would probably get quite violent and lead to the destruction of 10,000 lives at the Battle of Hastings. Might just drag you around by your hair and see where the night goes. William I, or more appropriate, William the Conqueror, was a fierce warrior and the first Norman King of England. Being the illegitimate child he was to the throne, some people didn't exactly respect the power moves old Willie was making. People rebelled, and he crushed them. Oh, and there was this one time that he fancied a woman named Matilda. Being the respected woman that she was, she declined Willie's advances. Willie, not taking no for an answer, promptly dragged her around by the hair until she agreed to marry him. Gee, what a, what a swell guy. Number 9. Let them eat cake. France had seen better days in the 1790s. People were starving, the economy was bust, and for some reason the poor citizens were being taxed the most. When cries were made from the people, they demanded that change be made. King Louis XVI being the great leader he was, he listened to the people and there was no problem ever again. Oh wait, he did nothing and the country had a bloody revolution. The man supposed to be leading his people failed to act. In fact, he did less than nothing, often trying to silence the riots by force. But when people are very hungry and you're living fat with high society, you can lose your head in all that chaos. While the famous quote, let them eat cake, may not have actually been said, it's a good reminder of the disconnect between the upper class and poor. Leaving your people to starve isn't the best idea if you want to be a king for a long time. Number 8. Cashback King George III had a simple ask of the American colonies. Right then, we just saved you all from the French and Indians, so now it's time to do the right thing and pick up the bill. Britain introduced new taxes on the colonies in order to pay back what it had spent on the previous war. But in reality, he was asking the colonies to pay up without much in return. Basically, I'm the king, I saved your skins, give me more money. Which most people at the time couldn't afford. And I'm still gonna boss you around. The British Empire may have been victorious, but it was the colonists who felt all the effects of the war and the economy. This happened multiple times before some patriots had had enough and decided to act. And what he did when the people he was forcing to give money spilt a little tea? Well, he sent British troops for a semi-friendly military occupation. I hate to loan this guy a nipple. Number 7. Terrible Ivan He wasn't called Ivan the very friendly and generous and would for sure never cause any harm to anyone ever. He was Ivan the Terrible, and for good reason. His actions are very unholy. Let's start with the fact that he killed his son's pregnant wife. And when his son came to confront dear old dad, his son was struck with a pointed staff, killing him in a fit of rage. A legend tells us that once St. Basil's Cathedral was finished construction, he was so pleased with the architect to reward him for such magnificent work, Ivan gouged his eyes out so that no one would ever design something so beautiful again. His paranoia also caused the slaughter of Novgorod, where after he was done claiming thousands of lives, he burned all the fields just for good measure. Wouldn't want all those dead people farming without your permission. Should we tell them about the other world monuments? Number 6. Off with her head! Henry VIII is more well known for how he treated his wives more than his leadership. With a reign of over 20 years, the man had a few wives. 
Two of his wives were executed for ridiculous reasons. Another was divorced. Turns out, actually, the church wouldn't grant that divorce he was looking for. So Henry went and did the next best thing. He broke away from the Catholic Church and dissolved the monasteries, taking their wealth and redistributing it as he saw fit. Nothing is unholier than trying to get away from the church. Historians believe that his divorce actually led to the English Reformation. Number five, diamond scandals. Queen Mary wasn't the only queen with sticky fingers, it seems. The affair of the diamond necklace has sparked many conversations. France's queen from 1774 to 1792 was Marie Antoinette, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because she was the last queen before the French Revolution. She was also known for spending a buck on jewelry. She liked she liked the diamonds. Now this Countess de Lamotte was this young lady, a friend of the queen, supposedly, who entered the French court in 1785. Now she got somebody to disguise herself as the queen and then she acted like she was in love with this high society member, all to get her hands on this $12 million necklace. Now she said that she would pay, but never ended up paying a dime, so that's horrible by itself. And the queen supposedly had no idea about any of this or what happened to the necklace. Although this countess pretended to be her friend beforehand. The public went on to hate her for this, not believing in the scandal of course. One of the most notable lines from Marie Antoinette was when the French spoke out for not being able to afford bread. She apparently said, well let them eat cake, which led into the French Revolution and ultimately her demise. Shine bright like a diamond, I guess. At number four, test drives. Catherine the Great of Russia was well known for a number of things. She was known for being a good leader, a strong ruler, and surprisingly for her naughty bedroom fun times as well. She was well known for her adventures in baby making, and there was once a rumor that she did the deed with a horse. Obviously that wasn't actually true, however she did do it with a lot of men. The only problem that she really faced when it came to finding a new partner was actually having the time to do so. I mean, it's not like she could swipe through Tinder while sitting on her throne, right? What was most important to her was finding a new lover who was skilled in the sack and she didn't really want to waste time on testing these guys out, so she had someone else do it for her. Catherine had a friend take her potential partner out on a test drive, so to speak, so that she wasn't wasting her time on someone who couldn't meet her standards. Remember, she is a very busy woman. It is said that on a couple of occasions, Catherine's tester friend was caught in bed with Catherine's partner again well after the Empress was with him and that made things a little complicated. But I imagine that they got past that. Or at least I really hope they did. Number three, change religion. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336, Queen Nefertiti, aka Lady of Grace, aka the Lost Queen of Egypt, was only 15 years old when she married 16-year-old Akhenaten. Now, alongside her new young husband, she built an entirely new capital city called Amarna and ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in ancient Egyptian history. But when it comes to spoiled queens, or rather queens who could do anything they believe with their power, we have to mention the queen that changed Egypt's religion. Both her and her co-ruler were in a cult, the cult of the sun god, Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time, and there have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Thibian tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, part of the sun god rituals. So now cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. Some queens change laws, others change religion. At number two, fake village. Imagine being so privileged and so disconnected from the world that you pretend to be poor for fun. Well, that's pretty much what Marie Antoinette did. This French queen was known for her lavish and opulent lifestyle, and that's really the only life that she knew. Apparently, living the life of a rich queen started to get a little boring for her, and she wanted to find an escape, and so she got her people to build a fake village for her so that she could pretend to be a commoner. This fake village included 11 cottages, a lake, a water mill, a working dairy, a windmill, a barn, and other quote unquote peasant buildings. Marie apparently loved this little peasant village and she would bring other people to enjoy it too. When she brought her guests to the village, she expected them to yes and their way through the day and really immerse themselves into their role of a common person. She would even tell her ladies to ditch the ball gown and wear something simple to blend in. Marie even took her kids to the fake village to teach them about farming. Even though she loved her pretend peasant lifestyle, it still didn't help her bond with the real common people and it certainly didn't save her from the guillotine. And finally coming in at a number one spot, surprise entrance. The last true pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra VII ruled from 69 to 30 BC. 
She's known mainly for her love interests, of course, her two mans, Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar. And to this day, we're still trying to uncover more dazzling details of the lost queen. Now, she ruled alongside her young brother, and her life was much more than being just beautiful, which is what everyone seems to focus on more than anything. Both children were assigned to the throne, Cleopatra being 18 and little bro being 10 years old. So Cleopatra, being a little older, therefore a little wiser, became the ruler. A couple years passed and eventually Cleopatra was pushed out of Alexandria over her greed for power, classic, but her little brother, equally a co-ruler, had her driven out. He was jealous and honestly, I'm the youngest in my family, I kinda get it. But Cleopatra wasn't quite done yet, she had a few tricks up her sleeve. Believing she was the goddess Isis, reborn, this beautiful goddess, Cleopatra made these dazzling entrances whenever she could. Most notably in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria, during that family feud with Ptolemy VIII. She wanted to meet the Roman general, but she couldn't be seen, because there was a little bit of family beef, so she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack, and then personally delivered to Caesar's bedroom. Hashtag, your order has arrived. Surprise. Now she won the heart of Rome's future dictator here, obviously, and eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance, and in the following battle, he drowned in the Nile River, resulting in Cleopatra's return to power. Number 10, Elizabeth I. Good old Queen Bess is one of the most remembered queens in the British monarchy, male or female. She's a pretty big deal. Elizabeth loved to make her fellow male nobles fall under her spell. She was witty, cunning, and very well liked by her court. However, one of the things that earned her some enemies was establishing a Protestant England. Her sister Mary, her predecessor, fought very hard for the opposite. She was very Catholic, and we will get to how bloody that was later, but Queen Bess a lot of people off, especially Spain. She was supposed to marry the Catholic Spanish king after her sister passed, but uh, she turned him down. This led to a conflict between Protestant England and Catholic Spain, but her navy defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Mary, Queen of Scots, laid claim to the English throne and was one of Lizzie's greatest internal threats. Mary was a Catholic, which made all the Catholics of England back her. Mary was also presumed to be behind several assassination attempts against the queen. Finally, Queen Elizabeth had to take action and after keeping her cousin hostage for 20 years, she finally had to have her executed. And we'll talk more about her later. Number 9, Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great was called the Great for a reason. She was a pretty epic woman by most accounts. She even had one of the first vaccines, which is pretty crazy. Though she wasn't actually born in Russia or even Russian at all, Catherine was not content to go down in history quietly. She considered herself an enlightened ruler and history tends to agree with aims of prioritizing education for the people. She had many lovers and there is enough evidence to suggest that the son she had was illegitimate. Peter III of Russia was hardly the man Catherine intended on marrying, and later planned a coup against him which resulted in her position of power. However, the coup did turn bloody when on July 17th, Peter died under mysterious circumstances. There isn't proof that she was directly involved or even knew about it, but it cast a dark shadow over her reign for the rest of the time. Number eight, Grace O'Malley. We've got enough traditional royalty on this list that we definitely need to spice it up. Enter Grace O'Malley, the pirate queen of Ireland. Pirate queen, what a title. Definitely considered unholy behavior, Grace abandoned the traditions of women of the time and fled to the sea. There, she took on the waves and perils of Davy Jones' locker with a legendary ferocity. She was born into the clan O'Malley around 1530, around the time of Henry VIII's rule over England and Ireland. Clan O'Malley was a notorious seafaring clan and ruled the southern shore of Clue Bay, Aquiland, and most of the barony of Murrisk for over 300 years. Grace was really well educated and could even converse fully in Latin, Spanish, Scottish, Gaelic, and French. She was not one to be refused, and after spending years fighting the British, she finally met Queen Bess. And not only did she speak Latin to her, but she refused used to bow as she was considered a queen herself by that point. Number 7, Mary Queen of Scots. I told you I was going to bring her up. A name you will recognize as I've already mentioned her before, but in terms of who the villain in that story is, it depends on which side you're telling the story on. Mary's story is full of tragedy, romance, betrayal, loss, and heartbreak. Unlike Lizzie, Mary was a dedicated Catholic and spent the entirety of her reign trying to gather the Catholics against Elizabeth. She had a series of marriages and relationships that led to tragedy 
every which way she went. Her first husband, the Dauphin of France, died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband, she loved until he became a drunkard, and then she just started running things. But he was mysteriously unalive while she was six months pregnant. He was inside a building that exploded, but his body landed outside, and it turned out he was strangled. So what happened there? She would later give birth to two stillborn sons, but she would have sons later on. She would have a son who would inherit the throne after Elizabeth's death, but it was due to Mary's plotting and scheming that eventually ended her in death. So she did actually plot to kill Elizabeth. So that's a pretty unholy deed, I would say. Number six. Princess Olga of Kiev. Okay, wow, this woman. One saint you definitely don't want to mess with. Despite being a saint, Princess Olga of Kiev was actually pretty sinful. She was one of the most vicious and vengeful rulers in the history of Kievan Rus, which would later become Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Olga took center stage after her husband died and made sure she would never be forgotten. Her husband died in a very gruesome way by the enemies that we're going to talk about in a second. When the people who viciously unalived her husband tried to persuade her to marry their leader, they sent 20 men. Olga told them to wait in their boats, had her men dig a ditch in the meantime, and the next morning buried the men alive. She then lied and told the king she would accept his offer if he sent his best company to retrieve her. He didn't know about all that stuff yet. When they got there, she locked them in a bathhouse and torched it. But it didn't stop there. Olga didn't stop there. That's not her style. She would later host a steak dinner with her enemies in which they were staked. Very Vlad the Impaler, I know. Then she set whole villages on fire by attaching sulfur to pigeons and then it was just crazy. Damn, like hell has no fury like a woman scorned, let me tell you. Number five, George V. We love hobbies here on Bumblebee. I mean, I used to collect special quarters growing up. I swear to God, the only time I've ever been good at saving money was when I was 12. I would see one of these and be like, mm, don't touch it. George V turned out he loved stamps. A lot, like a lot, a lot. Since he was a wee young lad, he was collecting these little guys. Here's the unusually impressive part about him though and his hobby. He continued to collect stamps during World War I. This guy was busy, everybody's trying to stay alive and George is just licking stamps in the library like a prince. Like all collections, it started at an early age and now it's at the point where it's past impressive and it's just borderline strange. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. Quick maths, that's like 20,000 pages full of stamps. So naturally he was nicknamed the king of stamps, or rather the king of philately, the official term for collecting stamps. It's a nice word. Philately. Philately. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record, which I didn't even know that was the thing, and it was the most money ever spent on a single stamp. The guy dropped like 220,000 US on a single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about this idiot who spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp, and he was proud of it. He was like, that was me, that was me, you wanna see it? The next King George is a little different, to say the least. At number four, Womanizer. I'm going to preface this by saying that George IV of England was voted as England's worst king by historians, so that should already tell you a lot about this guy. Georgie here was yet another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his intimate conquests, you know? Now we do know that the encounters that he was on were all consensual, so that's a plus. However, he was still creepy about it. Yeah. This man tried everything to get a woman to sleep with him, he would throw a tantrum if she said no, or threaten to end his life if he didn't get to do the eight-legged nature dance, you know? Somehow, this had a pretty good success rate, even though he was not a catch at all. It feels like this was one of those situations where you kinda just give in to make him stop talking, you know? Anyways. This guy was super creepy because on top of the lengths that he would go to just to get some time in the sack, he also kept trophies of his conquests. He would ask each of the people he slept with for a lock of their hair and he kept them all. Back then it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. Fun fact, if you want to see this insane collection, it is in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want, I guess. Number three, kleptomania part two. On our spoiled queens list, Brie mentioned Queen Mary and how she just couldn't stop stealing, which is hilarious to me, just this old lady stealing your 
Well, the last king of Egypt also had sticky fingers. He was even better at it too. Check this out. Farouk I was the youngest son of Egypt's first king, Fouad I. Now born in 1920 in Alexandria and in his early days at school, he couldn't concentrate. The king sent him to England even after to hopefully find a better way of teaching, something that works for him, but still it was to no avail. Once the king passed away in 1936, Farouk then got the throne, but also so much property and so much money. He had hundreds of fancy cars, 75,000 acres of land. This guy had it all. Literally, he had anything he could think of, but still, he felt like he needed to take more, to steal. At 17 years old, he would slam 12 eggs for breakfast and then wash it down with 30 bottles of beer. Nutritious and delicious. Horrible. On top of the fact that he loved to steal, he was the biggest hoarder. So he had thousands of shirts, randomly. He also had 50 diamond studded walking sticks for some reason. And like a prince such as myself, he too collected coins. I mean, his collection was much nicer, but still, great minds think alike. Spoiled minds think alike, rather. Oh shit, this is eye opening. One of the most bizarre facts about Farouk was he pickpocketed Winston Churchill once. He took the guy's watch. After everything I just said, he still decided to steal his watch. What a gem. We love him. We at number two, the king of pettiness. Let's talk about a ruler that the Indian state of Alwar has described as controversial. If his own people are calling him controversial, then you know something's up. And boy, you better strap in because you're in for a wild ride with this one. Maharaja Jai Singh was pretty eccentric in a pretty dark way. He was known to have a temper and act on impulse, and he did some very questionable and downright scary things. He was known to be very competitive and hated to lose. One time while playing polo, he and his team lost, and so in retaliation, he blamed the horse he was using and made the horse get extra crispy. He uh, fired his horse. I'm sure you know where I'm going by that. If not, use your noodle, I don't know. Unfortunately, the cruelty towards living things didn't stop in animals, and he was also known to kidnap women from the streets and go all criminal minds on them. On a slightly lighter note, though, the Maharaja was also known to be very petty. Once he went into a Rolls Royce dealership, and the person working there thought that he was broke and ignored him. Thinking that this was insanely rude, he bought seven Rolls Royces, sent them back to India, and used them to pick up garbage. This guy was really just doing the absolute most. And coming in at our number one spot, King Ludwig II. Home renovation shows rock my world. I can watch Love It or List It for months at a time. It's the dream, building your own home one day. And if you're a king, well, it's pretty easy to get that done. In our Spoiled Queens part two, I mentioned a princess that had a house made of ice, literal ice. Well, King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tales, literally like, fairy tales. I gotta admit, I kind of love this a lot. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the king of Bavaria in 1864, and then he had castles, like castles, more than one, built after he was inspired from romantic literature and spending some time at the opera. The kid was a dreamer, you gotta love it. He would spend his nights in one castle looking through a telescope at his new castle being built, so he would just watch it all night. That's like the king's way of waiting for your Amazon delivery. Just standing there, just like, oh, it's coming. 17 years and it's done. Just four years in, he designed his own castle, and to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world. Neutrinstein Castle. Go check it out. It's literally a paradise. Kicking off the list at number 10, a fool. While ancient kings have all the riches one man can possibly have, it's still somehow never enough. Kings also have their own walking, talking party. Yeah, how fun is that? The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century. These fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, just jumping around on tables, telling jokes, juggling with big pointy shoes, wearing pajamas. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. It was pretty fun. One of the best jobs to have was the title of a minstrel or a fool. It was an honor to have, really, and the fool's payment was no joke. Roland Le Pichur was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II. As as long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart. Literally, he would show up and fart around. But these fools also held responsibility in their silly little lips. Fools needed to find the balance of humor and wit. It was harder back then than anything. Many of these jesters were given the rule of advisor to the king and queen. The phrase, don't shoot the messenger, this is where it comes from. The jester would have to tell them horrible news, but in a fun, positive way. For example, back in 1340, King Philip IV, his fleet was destroyed in naval battle, the British completely wiped them out, and it was an otherwise devastating loss, but the jester, the fool, brought this news in a light way. He said to the king, they don't even have the guts to jump into the water like our brave French do. 
and then he farted and disappeared. Number 9. Access to clean water Today in a modern world, there are things that we just can't live without. A vape pen, Starbucks, and that weird looking back massager that everyone says they bought for their backs, but it's actually for their undercarriage. Speaking of undercarriages, you don't want to drink from the water from underneath one. Dirty, muddy street water is bad for your health. The ancient kings of old knew this. It was common knowledge that drinking dirty water could lead to you spending more time squatting over a hole than spending time with your family, and, and nobody wants that. Life for citizens who were not royals could have it pretty rough. Ancient kings had the luxury of having clean water. Or Somewhat, it's still kind of not so clean, or at least more clean than the commoners. Through methods of fresh spring water, boiling, and even some early filtration methods, they had access to better water that wouldn't make their guts hurt. With that being said, a lot of times, given the sussy nature of water, a lot of kings just drank alcohol, which honestly might have saved them since the alcohol could possibly kill harmful bacteria. The one time in life that boozing might save your life. Anyone got a beer? Number eight, ladies first. These ancient kings, they could literally do whatever they wanted. And it's important to note how they would act if they didn't get what they wanted, right? Like George IV of England, he's referred to as England's worst king by historians. Great title, even worse than King Joffrey, what do you know? It's one thing to spiral into debt, that's classic king behavior. MC Hammer went broke, we get it, it happens. But George IV, he was all about the ladies, a little bit too much. All he wanted in life was just to hook up with women. That was it, his only desire in life. And if they weren't interested, George was known to throw fits. He would cry and stomp his feet, literally. You know how those brave and bold kings do. George would offer these ladies money, although they weren't for sale, so that wasn't a great plan and didn't work a lot of the time. And George would go so far to threaten his own well-being if they refused. How terrible is that guy, right? Just imagine that conversation, how insane. What takes this to the absolute next level though is that George would keep a lock of his partner's hair after they had spent the night together. Now I know you're freaking out, maybe you're like, huh? Maybe you just choked on your rye bread sandwich a bit, that's more than fair. At the time, this wasn't abnormal behavior. I mean, you know, lovers would exchange their hair instead of phone numbers, I get it, it's back in the old days. But George, he had a lot of hair. He had like a lot, a lot of hair. He had like 7,000 envelopes filled with hair. I'm over here exchanging phone numbers at the club. Like, what am I doing wrong? Am I, doink? Call me, peace. Number seven, food. Nice. Whether you like it or not, at some point in your life, you're gonna have to eat. And if you're like me, that means all the time. Steaks, ribs, beer, Burger King, pizza, pasta, ham, and chicken wings. Nice. It should be no surprise that I like beer and barbecue. And to answer your question, yes, I am the most fun guy to be around at the barbecue. Why? I, I just like to have fun and I like to eat good food, man. That, that's just it. Imagine a world, however, where there is no pizza and chicken wings. I know, it's horrible, right? Ugh. Food was always a concern of commoners in ancient times, and as much as I love meat, it wasn't always available. They just didn't live in the industrial agricultural world that we live in today. For Romans, it was a steady diet of breads and nuts, and if they were lucky, maybe some cheese or soup. But for the kings and emperors of old, well, if you feel like vomiting after all you can eat buffets, it makes you feel, you know, some first world kind of guilt, then look no further than ancient kings. Food might be the most excessive way they live, really. All kinds of meats all the time, beer, wine, fresh fruit and vegetables, which for health reasons is pretty huge, and to make them huge, maybe even some desserts. The Egyptians, for example, were known for their sweets. And now I'm hungry. We should go to a banquet together. Number six, 6,000 knights. Being a medieval knight, obviously, it sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, all that good stuff. They're saving the damsel in distress in some sort of tower. Well, no, it actually sucked being a knight at all. First of all, chainmail. You know how heavy chainmail is alone by itself? It's like 55 pounds. All that chainmail underneath your armor. No way, my body, this Q-tip spine would just break in half, no way. I can't even get on a horse wearing jeans and a shirt, let alone chainmail. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You gotta start with a little, little tot, a little royal tot. Then you'd be given to a noble to learn and be wise for seven years, some, you know, Yoda type scenario. And then at age 14, you become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but if you stick it out, just seven more years, then you're an official ting ting. Knight, that's it. But then what? Do kings have two knights? Do they have four each? Is it like a breakdance squad? Is it like eights, groups of eights? Like, do we, how do we do this? Henry II of England could call up to 6,000 knights. This was back in the late 12th century. That's a lot of backup. That's a lot of shiny, majestical backup. My favorite knight still to this day, I don't care, Martin Lawrence. Jamal Scott Walker. That's 
At number five, no bathing. These days, bathing is kind of a necessary thing. You gotta be clean, you have to smell nice, you have to practice proper hygiene. But back in the olden days, this was the complete opposite and nobles rarely ever bathed and it was kind of a trend. Over time, physicians began to believe that bathing was dangerous and obviously the nobility tried to protect their lives and well-being at all costs and so they just stopped bathing. In a popular 16th century medical book, it was advised, quote, use not baths or stews nor sweat too much. For all openeth pores of a man's body, maketh the venomous air to open and for to infect the blood." End quote. So yeah, they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. In the late 15th century, Queen Isabella of Spain would go around bragging about the fact that she had only ever bathed twice in her whole life. Weird flex, but okay. King James IV apparently never bathed and his hygiene was so bad that he passed on lice to other people who went into a room that was frequented by the king. He also never washed his hands before eating and would just rub his fingers with the wet end of a napkin. These people were gross. At number four, prankster king. You know that you're a spoiled king when you can pull pranks on people constantly and never have anyone try and stop you or fight back. This was basically the life of King Christian VII of Denmark, who was known for being pretty childish and playing pranks on people his whole life. He was a troublemaker through and through. He was known to play pranks on his grandmother by putting pins in her throne and he would throw things at her and he even ran through the streets with his friend and his mistress, destroying shops and patrons patronizing brothels. He even made his own torture rack, had himself tied to it, and flogged. Why? I have an idea, but I don't want to think about that one too hard. One of the other weird things that he was known to do was leapfrog over dignitaries when they would bow to him. This guy was really quite immature. At number three, saints in bed. I understand the desire to feel protected by whatever gods or saints you might believe in. That's one of the whole points of religion. However, I think some people can take that idea a little bit too far, and by some people, I mean the Spanish royal family. These guys took religion very, very seriously, and they believed that following religion heavily would allow God to heal them when they were sick. So, when a member of the royal family was ill, doctors would remove body parts or even entire corpses of saints from churches and monasteries and would put them in bed with the person who was ill. Yeah, they slept with the corpses of dead saints to be healed of their sickness. Could you imagine if that was still how medicine was practiced today? At number two, rat court martial. There has been a record of many kings throughout history who were complete children through and through. Even though many of them grew into adulthood, they still acted immature, and one of the greatest examples of that was Peter III of Russia. He was not a good ruler or a good husband to his wife, who would later become Catherine the Great. Peter spent every night in bed with her playing toy soldiers because he was obsessed with his little dolls. He was so obsessed, in fact, that when a rat chewed the head off one of his toy soldiers, he was so upset that he held a proper military court martial for the rat. He proclaimed the rat guilty of treason and had it hung in a tiny gallows that he had built for the occasion. It was weird, but in the end that bizarre event helped Catherine overthrow her husband, so I guess it kind of worked out for someone. And finally, at number one, groom of the stool. Guys, I found the worst job in history. You think working at the one star Domino's pizza in your neighborhood is bad? Wait until you find out about the groom of the stool. The groom of the stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry around a commode at all times, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his is uh break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have had to quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. Sounds like a pretty crappy job to me, but I'm just I'm not funny, I'll leave. At number 10, kleptomania. If you were a queen, then you would think that you had enough money to just buy whatever your little heart desired. Though that may be true, there was at least one famous queen who just straight up stole things just because she could. Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth's grandmother, was quite the kleptomaniac, and no matter how hard people tried to avoid having their things stolen by her, it just never worked. When the queen would visit someone's house, she would walk around looking at whatever knickknacks you had lying around, and when she found something that 
that she liked, she would stand there and just sigh super loudly to get someone's attention. Much like how my dog used to sigh dramatically when he wanted food. Anyways, usually when someone heard the sigh, they knew that this was a sign that the queen wanted whatever she was gazing upon. Sometimes the homeowner would just give whatever it was to the queen as a gift, gift. But if it was something that they weren't willing to part with, then she would either try to buy it off them or just straight up take it when no one was looking. This became such a big problem that people started hiding their prized possessions before hosting the queen in their home, but she eventually caught on to this strategy, so she just started showing up uninvited. She could not rest until she owned pretty much everything in the kingdom. Number nine, no time to dine. If I'm eating, don't acknowledge me as a human being. I sound like a pug when I eat, okay? I don't waste any time. I love food, okay? It's business. Now, if you're a queen and you eat fast, well, everybody else has to eat fast as well. This began back in Queen Victoria's time. The queen loved to feast and she didn't waste any time at all. Like, it's really fast. The way the royal family works is that when the queen is done that course or that meal, you're also done. So when Queen Victoria would smash an entire seven course meal in 30 minutes, which apparently she could do easily, you'd be blowing on your soup still and Queen Victoria would already be telling everybody to pack it up. That's stressful. All because she could eat lots of food in a short amount of time. Also, once the queen gave a toast, you couldn't even speak. Also, once the queen placed her cutlery on the table, regardless of where you were during that course, 